Hello, everyone. I'm Erica Lukes, your host for Expanding Frontiers. I am coming to you from a very, very hot Salt Lake City, Utah, and I am really uh, excited for my guest this evening. This is going to be a great conversation, and he is an artist and a very incredible researcher. And I can't, and I've been, I just totally geeking out on listening to his uh, interviews, and I, I hope someday that I can meet him in person. But first, I want to just lend your attention, get your attention to Expanding Frontiers Research. We are a nonprofit organization. So if you donate to us to help us with our research, to help us with collecting materials, doing FOIA requests, all of the, these things take money to operate and it is tax deductible. But you can go to expandingfrontiersresearch.org to get involved, to show your support. And I wanna thank the people that have already pledged their support and also the people that help keep this show on the air every week. I want to thank Mario especially. I don't think he is here because we're starting a bit earlier than usual, but it is um, definitely, you know, I appreciate your help and your love. And I want to say, hey, Scott and Ken from Michigan and Daniel uh, from LA. You're cooking from in LA. That sounds like fun. And Jay Bench. And uh, yes, this is great. So it's it's fun. No matter what time we do the show, I have people in Peter and then Peter from Bogota, Shadowy Spectrums. So it's nice to see you here. Um, it really makes me happy every week to get in here and see the same group of people who ask intelligent questions, who demand factual answers, which is what we deserve, and have created a really cohesive, intelligently and kind community that is really important to me because I see so many times on social media in some of these groups, I see a bullying mentality and that is extremely problematic uh, for, for me and it should be for other people. We definitely need to do what we can uh, to create a safe environment, not only for people who claim to have had experiences, but for people who are interested in the topic. Um, it doesn't need to be a knockdown drag out every time we engage in a subject. And if somebody's willing to do that to you, I'd say probably run away. So anyway, there you have my input for the evening. But now I'm going to add my guest. Neil Nixon is here. And what, so it's what time over there? Uh, it's just, just past nine o'clock, um, and um, it's interesting to hear that you're baking out there in Salt Lake City. It's the uh, it's the middle of the English summer. I'm sitting in the hottest county in England. And it's pouring down outside. Oh, I bet it's beautiful. Uh, you, <laughs> if, if you're sweltering in the heat, you could probably take an hour of this. You, you, you just go out and dance in it. But lovely. <laughs> that sounds really good to me, actually. I can tell you. Well, it's well, Funny enough, I, had, I won't bore you with the ins and outs. I had a corporate PR job to do tomorrow, which I was quite looking forward to. I was going to be at a live event for four or five hours, and the winds, the, the rain and the wind that is forecast for that is so bad that they can't, basically, they're not allowed to put the tent up because there's a serious danger they're going to blow away. So it's actually beyond their insurance. So it's been cancelled. So I've got an easy day tomorrow. Well, I'm sorry that it got cancelled, but I'm glad that you've got an easy day. And it's definitely, you know, no fun to perform or to, to speak out in the elements. I remember no. um, one time we were, um, I used to be a singer for a long, long time. And we had a gig and there was a, a lightning storm blowing through town. And I'm not quite sure what any of us were thinking on stage. But since we were outside, um, I guess lightning uh, struck and my lips were on the mic when it struck. <laughs> No. somewhere close and literally i mean obviously i had quite the, the shock uh, to my body but the microphone did stick on my lips for quite a while it was an interesting experience and one that wow. taught me to never sing during a lightning storm outside with electrical equipment around yeah absolutely <laughs> I'll, I'll remember not to if, any, if anybody ever asked me to sing in public I'll, I'll refuse when it's lightning i'm sure most people could probably figure that out but you know sometimes i learn lessons the hard way so what do you yeah. do <laughs> but i want to tell people a little bit about your wonderful um history what you've done for you know i mean you've, you you're so creative in many many different areas and so not only have you been researching the UFO topic and, and paranormal, you've had an interest in that for many, many years, but you've also are doing things. I mean, you're, you're a writer. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do in that regard. Well, so it, 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 it's, it's a long story, but I, I've been a professional, I was a professional academic 
that's the nearest thing to a proper job I had. And I did that for decades. And the last 20 years of that, I taught professional writing to university students. But I've been a, a professional writer since I was a student. Um, and without going into all the ins and outs, that's included almost everything you might imagine it including. So that's been, uh, I've done stuff for radio, for TV, I wrote a film that didn't get made, but we got paid quite a lot of money for it not being made. <laughs> um, and, you know, stuff for stage and, and loads and loads of print stuff. So without going into all the details, there's the latest book is the 30th that's either been written or edited by myself. And then there's contributions to a couple of dozen others. Um, and I mean, the stories, if I'm doing the live gigs, the stories I tell are sort of some of the more unlikely things I ever did as a writer. So it won't mean a huge amount in the United States, but I worked for two years for um, a British glove puppet company, uh, which trades the, the main star of the glove puppet stable is a, a, a puppet called Sooty whose live performances go back to the 1940s. But the interesting thing, even a script writer, is that Sooty doesn't speak. Um, so it's an, you know, you've, you've got problems scripting Sooty. <laughs> it's it's a script uh, I, was, I was mainly script doctoring for them and developing new ideas. So I didn't have the main problem of trying to build an entire story around a little bear that won't speak. Um, but I, I've done that. I've done quite reputable stuff as well, you know, sort of textbook things and, and whatever. And written a couple of novels under other names and I spent years writing comedy before it is so long ago now but before the internet took over and any topical joke could appear within seconds there was a whole stable of what they called alternative humor comics in the United Kingdom uh, a bit like mad magazine but a lot more kind of down market in terms of the humor and everything like that and I worked for all of them which was probably the most enjoyable thing work-wise I ever did it was just like I just sit down for a couple of hours and just come up with jokes which was uh, just yeah and the money was quite good so it, it's all sorts of stuff but along the way and this is why we're talking tonight there's been quite a serious paranormal investigation including like academic paper paranormal investigation and I always intended when I packed up the academic career to get back into the paranormal business um, I, I really, I ducked out of it in, in the late 90s and I'll be totally honest that the reason I did that was that when it all went to the internet, there was so much free content, it was very difficult to get paid good money for writing for a magazine or something, so um, there was way more money in writing about football and rock music, so I kind of did that until the end of my academic career. And then I always intended to get back out and write books about it and speak, do live speaking again about it, because it's, it, it's the passion basically. So. Um, I timed that very badly. I got back to the, I got back to the live circuit about a month before the country locked down. <laughs> so I got one gig in. Uh, I, did, I did, I did one live talk behind my UFO book. And again, without going into all the details, the pandemic absolutely slaughtered the plans to launch the UFO book in 2021. Um, because just to do with what it did to book selling, it devastated the advance orders. But um, you know, we're building back quite well, and I've got another book out about called Why Mystery Matters, about mystery, which I hope we can talk about tonight. Yes. Um, and I'm I'm out there doing the gigs and stuff now, and getting quite a bit of you know webinar bookings and stuff. And it's 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 what I planned to do. It just took a bit longer because of COVID, but you know, we're getting there. Good. I know. Finally, things are starting to get back to normal. That was such a strange time for I think everyone on the planet, but um, we made it through. And so, do you remember the young ones? What the young ones, as in the TV? Yeah. Oh, oh, hell yeah, yeah. I love. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed when Americans ask me about it, but it's great. Yeah. Well, well I, I totally forgot about it, but Scott, who's uh, over in Ireland, he just asked about that, and he wanted to know if you had anything to, to do, if you wrote for the young ones. Oh no, I didn't. Um, oh hell no, that would have been a gig. That would have been a gig and a half. Uh, no, I found them really funny. I've had dealings with one of them. Um, I've had dealings with Nigel Planer, who's called, ne you know, the Neil, yeah? Yeah. A long, a long story short, but I've got a radio show, and um, on it's a two-hour two hour or thereabouts a week, and in the middle of the first hour, we always play something. It's the WTF question mark slot, <laughs> and I've played some of his music uh, because people don't realise he was a singer-songwriter. He's, he's the oldest of the young ones by some degree, so he's about 70 now. And he um, made some records when when he was a student, he recorded and he sounds in those early incarnations, he sounds very like a guy called Nick Drake, um, you know, plausibly out of the same stable. And uh, anyway, cut a long story short, 
I got hold of some of his 1970s recordings when he put them online, but virtually nobody knew they were there and we played them and he was quite grateful because nobody was playing it anywhere. Yeah, a really nice guy. I mean, I'm, I, I've only been on the end of an internet link with him, so I don't, I've not met the guy, but he was, he, he was both very grateful and very solicitous in terms of just answering any questions we had about his recordings. That is cool. Oh, I'm going to have to try to, I, I would like to listen to those. That would be really fun because that's on Bandcamp. If you look him up on Bandcamp, Nigel Plan. I mean, it, I, the, re, the reason I say he was very chatty was because, of course, I used to talk to people. I was a professional academic for years, which meant lecturing. And in the 1980s, I was lecturing and I was called Neil. And it, occasionally you'd get it, particularly if it's a big room full of art students and they're all sitting in the dark and, you know, I'm showing them slides or something. I, Neil, would say something and somebody in the back would go, oh, wow. You know, as in like just taking, <laughs> take it yeah, just anyway. But so I told him all of that, which he thought was quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. I love it. Um, and so, OK, where, where would you like to start? Because I know that you have you sent some slides uh, for me to play or for me to play, for me to show. And so would you like me to, to start? Yeah, yeah, can, can we just rattle them up and I'll, yeah. I'll talk about those. And then you yeah. just ask me, we'll take them down quickly and just ask me some questions and we'll chat. That would be brilliant, Erica. Yeah, yeah okay, absolutely. So the first. Right. So that that is my UFO book from two years ago. So that normally when I'm doing a live gig, I've got this one currently on a couple of pre-prepared lectures I've got. I've got this one and the one you're going to show up on there. And I kind of wander around and tell a couple of jokes or something at the start of it. And then I just casually point out that what I'm really doing is letting people look at it long enough. And I'm kidding on that. I don't care whether you buy it, you know. Um, but that, it's, it's, a, it's a book called UFOs, Aliens and the Battle for the Truth. It's a, it's a kind of erudite introduction, I would describe it as. So it doesn't take sides other than... I'm on the side of the evidence, basically, um, and it's just if it's a serious introduction to the subject that will not take you forever to read. I love the cover. That looks great. So did I. And I had a completely different idea about the cover. And the second that the publishing company sent me that and said, well, this is the best our designer can do. I was completely blown by that. Brilliant. Yeah. It was completely different to what I imagined. Yeah, <laughs> it's very simple, and I, I really like that. That's cool. I like the colors. Bring up the next slide. I'll tell you something. Okay. So, <laughs> UFOs, aliens, and the battle for the truth. I'd imagined a cover more like this, but there was a UFO in it. So my idea about what would make a good book cover actually came on this one, which is this has come out in earlier this year. So, <clears throat> this is the latest book. I.e., this is the reason I'm quite happily talking on webinars and stuff at the moment that. It's a book about, crudely, it's about why we all need to grapple with the mysterious in our lives, why it's good for our mental health and why it's good for our critical thinking. Um, so it's why it matters. And also within that, um, there's an argument towards the end of it about why more than ever mystery, i.e. the uncanny experience in our life, is actually under threat. And so what are you, why is it under threat? Oh, right. So it's under threat because more than ever, we're, um, we're, we're driven into silos by algorithms. I mean, you know all this, the this, this sort of online content that we're being offered the whole time. So there are a couple of reasons why it's under threat. First of all, because the way that particularly younger people who've not experienced a world before the Internet encounter information now, does drive us into silos and then it drives us into discussions where they're quite circular. And the, the competition there, if you think about it, I mean, I'm old enough that I get the business model here, but I remember business models that were earlier. So in effect, one of the reasons that Mark Zuckerberg is so rich is because we all work for him. Yeah. You know, if, if we, but we do, I mean, we're, we're all content creators. Absolutely. Um, and we sold that on the basis of it being a social network. But if we don't create the content and drive people to our own pages and off our own pages to other things, but we use, well, Facebook is the biggest, obviously. So if we use that as the conduit by which we discover everything, then he's selling advertising, harvesting data and meta rather, but not, not just him. So mystery is driven out of that because the both the algorithms and also the brain chemistry that the algorithms are feeding on, it's always feeding the reward center of our brains and it's always driving us to more and more content and it's promising us quick answers to questions that it's posing you know so simple things like this actress was really 
amazing in this part 33 years ago and we haven't seen her since you won't believe what she's doing today yeah yep, right? yep, yep, yep. Right. so it, and it doesn't matter you can be in the middle of a sales meeting it's like well you know i'm only one click away nobody will notice it. <laughs> <laughs> no, and look I, i'll cop for doing it it's back when years and years ago i used to teach an actress that was in a thing called grange hill which was a british she was she was a theater student but she was also working as um an actress in this Grange Hill thing that was a quite popular British TV drama. Um, and I just, I saw something online the other day about what she's doing now, because there was a thread on the site about what Grange Hill's up to. And I fell for that, it's like, what the hell's we, where's Ruth these days? And I didn't imagine that she was a youth worker in New Zealand, so I was really glad I clicked on it. So, you know, th these kind of things are driving us in that direction, which means that we're not encouraged to just ponder something that is huge and mysterious and grapple in our own heads with it. So that's the first reason that mis why, why mystery is under threat. The second reason that mystery is under threat is because the same tools that I'm talking about there are very useful to people who would like us to believe certain things. So without going into the whole story, this in the chapter at the end of the, the book on why, why mystery is under threat, I quote a couple of things. I quote the infamous Kellyanne Conway quote, about the alternative facts, right? I mean, it, it, I'm sure it's yeah, it challenged with the fact that Barack Obama's second inauguration, which was hardly a novelty because he'd already been there for four years, pulled more spectators than Donald Trump's first. If you remember Kellyanne Conway, who was one of Trump's press team at the time, disputed it. And when, <laughs> when the press corps said, well, we've actually got the aerial photographs, we can estimate the size of the crowd from those. Her response was the alternative facts thing, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, and then <clears throat> similarly, there's a there's a discussion in the mystery book about um, a similar kind of thinking that goes that went on from 2004, where an unnamed aide of George Bush's, as in the younger Bush, um, and to this day, nobody knows who he is. He's not identified online, but effectively, he had a chat with the Washington press corps and <clears throat> he had a dispute with them and he he he, he crudely said that he pitied them because they still relied on facts. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> that wasn't the narrative anymore. So mystery is under threat because it's it's in the interest of certain people that we could just be led to believe what they would like us to believe. And I'm, I'm not just singling Republicans in America there, just those two just happen to be examples. But, you know, it's a constant thing in this country and I'm sure in your country that when when people are discussing <clears throat> people in the public eye in controversial situations forever talk about controlling the narrative well the operative word there is the singular as in the implication is that they can find a singular narrative well if you can find a single narrative that explains everything then you've taken mystery away right yeah. so mystery is under threat because more and more people want to control the narrative and what we're left with is a series of self-serving insular viewpoints rather than the notion that we just grab we just accept that so many things are bigger and more mysterious than we can understand and we actually celebrate that you know and i i mean it's an, it, it, that you that's a great those are wonderful thoughtful um ideas and i think that is Im important because we are like to me i mean the internet has been it's useful in many ways but it does almost take away your own ability to to be intuitive to you know i mean to you know, like you mentioned kind of putting your mind out there in a larger context but you just get in, you know siphoned into these silos as you, mm. as you say. And I think <clears> that, that <throat> does take away a lot of who we are in my yeah well, but, but you're absolutely right erica it is who we are because the studies of brain chemistry and studies of the structures of the brain suggest that our brains, I mean, effectively, we've got Paleolithic brains, we've got Stone Age brains, give or take, right? Um, and they evolved for certain reasons in that direction. So our Homo sapien brains basically were more successful than Neanderthal brains, but actually there's a lot of overlap. Um, and it is who we are. The, the ability to experience the uncanny, the ability to process very complicated things to do with creative experiences, for example, is hardwired. And it goes back, you know, it, it's there for evolutionary reasons, but we've learned to use it in ways that mean that we've developed our culture around this. So 
um, I could bang on about it, or I could tell you that there's a really erudite discussion of this in a book called um, This Is Your Brain on Music by Dan, Dan Levinson, which I not long ago read, and he discusses quite odd things like the fact that the, the lower areas of the brain, the cerebellum and, and down there, whilst they're associated with very simple things like timing things so drummers use a cere cerebellum right and musicians tell jokes about drummers being ignorant don't they um you know, <laughs> but on the other hand it's also the source of feeling so actually even now even the bits of the brains that we share with reptiles are part of our emotional responses and then that's dotted out through our lobes as, or whatever so in other words our experience of something uncanny like say enjoying a symphony is actually if you look at it on an mri it's mapped by a brain that lights up in di many different areas and they communicate with each other and we're designed to do that because our more complex experiences when we were what we would now regard as primitive it mattered that we developed the cultural cohesion it mattered that we developed the you know the ability to stay together and to share the experiences so we've come on in the last few centuries to build that to the kind of cultures that we celebrate particularly in the west and there is a significant danger that um the way that we're going about accessing information and sharing it now and building cultural models now is actually going to undermine that so mystery in a, in a i mean that, that's you know that that's a sort of shorthand overview of the whole thing but mystery our we're not encouraged to grapple with the mysterious in the way that we did and actually it's, when we do ignore that and grapple with it it's good for our brains there's, there's something that's mentioned in the book which i'll it's probably more famous in in the united states than it is in the uk but um <clears throat> there's a book that came out this year about or a w e or right mm -hmm. uh, and it's the guy that wrote it dacca keltner he and a number of other academics had done research into people's experience of things that just absolutely dwarfed them uh and they've done these things called all walks where they send people quite a simple experiment and um this was done virginia sturmer who was one of the um virginia sturm sorry who was one of the researchers on this sent people out to do all walks in california so, but basically go and walk for half an hour and when you do all we're asking you to do is to photograph yourself at the beginning in the middle and at the end of the walk right and it's a psychology experiment so obviously every subject tries to second guess you but most people thought it was about physical fitness literally walking so they didn't really uh skew their own experiment and one thing that they discovered in that experiment was quite simple that in the selfies that these people took as the walks went on the people got smaller in their own selfies so if they're walking through like a big redwood forest or something <laughs> by half an hour later they're taking a little of themselves and a lot of tree yeah right and well it, it's a simple experiment but actually it, it's an indication of the fact that if we just let things that are bigger than us work on us and overwhelm us we actually experience good mental health it's really really good for us it, we don't necessarily understand it and if they weren't walking in natural environments they were walking in parks which replicate natural environments and if they were in neither of those they were in big cultural areas like art galleries so the whole point of the experiment was to put people in places where the surroundings would just work on them and overwhelm them uh and it, it you know it's it's quite a it got a lot of coverage and it was the experiment that was actually published in the i read about it in september 2020 so it seemed a very relevant thing to be talking about during the pandemic because a lot of people particularly where i live i live in a quite a rural area but basically people traditionally live here and work in london right mm -hmm. so it's full of commuters so it's busy at the weekends and quiet in the week or it used to be before the pandemic so as i was reading about this a lot of people who were locked down and not allowed to go to london anymore were, were discovering the same thing and all talking about it you know we were people were talking online about it just like have you seen how clear the sky is today that kind of thing which you wouldn't normally talk about on a tuesday but you know it was so mystery matters i mean it, it, it works on this that experiment suggests that we're hardwired for these things to work on us but on the other hand we're not always encouraged just to go out and just feel small i like that i think that's really important and i wanted to show that show your book one more time um and so where can people find this in, in, 
<laughs> in America, I, I don't know that any bookshop in America is stocking it at the moment. It's it's done okay over here because I've done some some live gigs in places, but it, it, Amazon.com on that one. Okay. Having having just bad mouth big tech, yeah, go to Amazon. Okay, all right. Um, no you're doing me a favor if you buy it from Old Can, which is the British publisher. But um, on the other hand, I don't know how easy that would be from America. It's definitely on Amazon.com. I looked at it the other day. Okay, well, I'll let you know when I buy it. <laughs> Get in there and, and do that. I would love to add that to my reading list because it just it's it's fun to to have. I mean, it would be fun for me to kind of reframe life in that way again, because I think, you know, for me, the pandemic and I mean, it did for a lot of people, it was very, it really drew you in, in inward. And mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, that wasn't necessarily the best, um, best thing. It could, could have been in different situations, but it is, I think, important to focus on, on, well, you know, mystery and and things yeah. that are larger. Talk about that reframing thing, right? Mm -hmm. So just before we came on air, when we were just checking that the cameras and the mics worked and everything. Um, so you and I are the same animal to a certain extent in that we started our paranormal interest with very clear ideas. We were reading probably the same UFO accounts and completely convinced in the same ways. Yeah. Yep. So the, the, the whole why mystery matters. It, it, it's me reframing what I've learned. That's basically why I wrote it. So it's after years of paranormal interest, I came to a few realizations just based on the stuff. So first of all, there's quite a lot in it about claims of the paranormal. Yeah, yep. obviously, because if we're going to understand mystery, we have to understand what people have been claiming and what it might mean. And we have to dispute, we have to examine the, the sort of serious claims. So there are some one or two kind of surreal UFO claims and stuff that are in there, which is the cases I've always found very interesting. Um, and so in that sense, I'm, I'm reframing it because I've, if I was going to boil it down, it would come to a few points, really. First of all, I can't deny that I've spent a lifetime involved in paranormal research in that time, decades ago and today. I was in a research group in the 1980s and then from then on I've been encountering people who've had experiences and now I'm back out doing live talks and webinars particularly at the live talks I always leave space at the end of it I'll take questions but if somebody wants to come up with an experience then I'll, I'll normally hang around rather than take that question in front of the group and it, it happens all the time people just randomly report amazing things to me so I can't deny that and I ended up reframing the whole thing really with thinking that we can't deny that people have the most incredible experiences, mysterious experiences. The common ground I see is the sincerity of the witnesses, right. definitely, right? And prove, you know, you, you can come on, you can do live interviews like this, and you're always talking about, well, you know, I met this person, I met that person. But let's talk about things that you could put up to evidential scrutiny. Most of us who've done this meet people who report experiences and want absolutely no publicity. Yeah, mm -hmm. they would be horrified if you wrote their stories down. You'd be horrified. They would be horrified if you did anything that allowed people to to identify them. Right. So I, I know from years of doing this that I meet people and I always kind of shorthand explain this as, as they've had experiences that are about as traumatic as a traffic accident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I they've walked away from it. It was scary. It's reframed the way that they think about their lives. So I can't deny that. And the, the, you know, the mystery book definitely addresses this. At the same time, I can't deny that all the, in my experience, all the straightforward, most popular answers that are put forward, particularly in ufology, which is my main area of interest, simply don't past scrutiny i mean if you want to put it in the in the simplest possible terms <clears throat> if it's all gray aliens if it's if all these lights in the sky are genuine ufos then actually there's no argument but that, that's not proven itself most of what those claims do most of what the gray alien claims do and most of what the big conspiracy claims do is they put these vast ideas out there but they're you can debunk them relatively easily because in, in crude academic terms, there are falsifiable answers to them. You, you can put another answer up and say, well, actually, 
the stuff here that proves you can't always be right. So the Hudson Valley UFOs, for example, which is still a, a staple of you know documentaries to this day. Well, there is no denying that a bunch of private pilots took off. And, <laughs> you know, the flight plan was filed. <laughs> and they're right where the UFOs are. There's, there's a famous place in this country. And oh, don't look like, can we have a, have you, have you, inter you must have interviewed Nick Pope at some point, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Right. Let, we'll have a Nick Pope free zone tonight, other than what I'm about to say, because that's just another bloody rabbit hole we could go down and spend the whole night. Um, <laughs> but there's a, if, if anybody in America is watching, there's a website called uh, Nick Pope Watch. It's a WordPress site. I don't know who's put it up, but it's absolutely scurrilous. But I know one case that he, he's a very, strong supporter of his um uh, thing it happened in Cosford in the UK and again it's complete the hypothesis that it was alien is there's a fault it's, you, you you can prove it's false that the UFO was the UFO sightings correspond with a fireball and then the low to the ground UFO sightings correspond with a police helicopter and the giveaway is that the witnesses spotting the UFO low to the ground didn't also see a police helicopter, which was in the same place at the same time. If there'd been two lights, I get it, right? <laughs> there's the police helicopter, there's the one from Zeta Reticulite, there's one light, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, so, sorry, I've gone off on one here, but the point I'm making is that, you know, I can't deny in, 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 in when, when I'm writing the book and everything, I can't deny that I find the simple popular answers unsatisfactory because they just don't hold water. And when you come down to certain cases, they just fall apart in front of you. So I'm still looking for the, the big answers that explain it, but I'm totally convinced in the sincerity of the people that I meet. So we've actually got two things that don't easily fit together. And in that sense, I think it's a, I think it's a real positive. I think that it's one of the biggest challenges to science and it, it frustrates me a little bit that in the middle of all of that because ufology is particularly ufology has undermined its own credibility over the years um it hasn't done itself any favors in attracting serious-minded skeptics academics people who could actually make a difference so in a very small scale way why mystery matters is an argument about maybe you should just stop and think about the whole area of what's mysterious and get involved Right. And I, mean, and I have to say just too, because I'm, you know, you're bringing up you know, ufology and then why people wouldn't want to get involved with serious, you know, this wouldn't be engaged seriously. And, and I think the most recent example that I've talked about on my show before is the fact that you have, you know, NASA uh, scientists who are, who are meeting and talking about things and they're not, you know, saying things that the quote unquote, you know, UFO community on Twitter, you know, would, it want them to say whoever these people are or you know whatever that group of people controlling the narrative is on that one but but you know then then it's all of a sudden the people there's you know heading the organization people that are are saying things in a very scientific way are being threatened and it's like come on you know i mean people it, we this subject will never ever be taken seriously especially with that kind of behavior it's ridiculous well it will and it won't um um I'm not quite as despondent as that, Erica, for a number of reasons. So again, I could go off on one. I could just give you a lot of bullet points on this. First of all, it, academic publishing is cheaper and more plentiful than it's ever been. So it's actually brought in people who were 20 years ago wouldn't have been taken seriously as academics. And it's allowing for research projects that wouldn't be taken seriously beforehand. So at the fringes of this, you've got people, social scientists who are doing very good work on, you know, the psychology, the sociology, the, the, the culture around paranormal belief. And for better or worse, a lot of these people are quite attracted to UFO subjects. Yeah. Yep. And when I, when, I, when I did the ASAP conference of the Seriously Strange Weekend that ASAP run every year, uh, I spoke at it last year and about well just less than half of the people presenting were presenting either recently published phd research or in progress phd research and it was things like they were looking at you know the social scientific studies of people who were hunting ghosts for example yeah wow or, well yeah but 
<clears throat> and the, these people are getting doctorates out of it because it's valid psychology, right? So um, in that sense, I'm not so despondent because I think that there's a generation of researchers coming through now. I mean, ASAP is mainly ghosts, which I, and I love it. They're, <laughs> I joined them because they were an easier group to join, frankly. So as a ufologist, or somebody who's mainly into ufology, I'm a bit of an outlier in ASAP. But I'll tell you this much about hanging around with ghost hunters when I used to hang around with UFO researchers. Number one, they're a lot more fun. Yeah, they spend they spend a lot of time hanging around in supposedly haunted buildings all night. They seldom see anything mysterious, but they don't have, have a good time seeing nothing. <laughs> yeah. and they're a much more inclusive group. I mean, you know, I, I, I love that about particularly that conference that I went to last year. And I'm, I'm I'm doing the first literally I'm first on stage this year um, you, you walk through the door at about half nine on a Saturday morning and any notion that you've got about what's normal in the world just has to get parked because, <laughs> you know <laughs> and it's just great it's just such a permissive environment and there's so much debate about possibilities so again that gives me hope because that kind of thing goes on it's fairly healthy it's it's pretty good natured and supportive more so than you know the ufo community that i used to belong to more actively in the uk and uh, that i think that that just promotes it, it it encourages other people to get involved for no other reason than you know you can go and get your mind blown completely legally you know you can <laughs> You can, you can spend all weekend just completely out of your head on different ideas and stuff like that and you're fit to drive a car at the end of the day so you know what's, what's not to like <laughs> i love that that sounds good to me <laughs> yeah but I, I don't know what the us equivalent is so um i'm doing a talk this year at the seriously strange weekend the talk's actually called putting the um app into asap which now you mentioned the nasa thing yeah mm -hmm. so <clears throat> CJ Roma, who's the the head of of ASAP, made a last last year, last September, NASA had just announced this one and a half million dollar, which is nothing really, is it? But they were just going to do like a a little research, yeah. But it's it's significant that NASA are doing it. And CJ got up and and said, well, if this kind of thing starts happening too often, they're not going to put us out of business. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and it, it just got me thinking when I was driving home from the conference that. Um, I don't think they will. I, I think that we'll always want the mysterious and I think they'll in the foreseeable future, even with artificial intelligence, there'll be a place for human groups that are researching the anomalous and the paranormal, I think. So I don't think it and, and I'm actually gonna I'm gonna spend the first talk this this year saying why I think that. Oh, I wish I could be there. That sounds fun. Is that are, are they doing that online as well? Oh um officially no but i've i've been party to some fairly animated discussions about why they should <laughs> so you right. just this space it's not my call i'm just i'm just speaking there i don't i'm not an official or any such thing so i don't know uh what's happening with that but i know um they do they do a weekly webinar so they, they've got quite an online presence oh, cool. um, and yes yeah, so, oh i mean obviously anybody join us up and anybody in america can sign up for it it's not necessarily the most convenient timing for americans but but most of them turn up on youtube afterwards anyway um there was some discussion about filming the conference i don't think there are any plans to do it but you never know and it, it, some people clearly want themselves filmed and i wouldn't be averse to it because you know it's it all helps if it goes out there so yeah Cool. We'll keep keep us posted. I'll check in with you and find out. That would be fun to see. So that's that's cool. Oh. Yay! And that I do. You know, it is interesting because I started back in in the day, kind of being. You know, I mean, at second grade, I'm picking up a UFO book, and I fell in love with the topic back then. But then I really went gravitated towards the paranormal, mm -hmm. and you know, spent time I had to do I went over to England to do some some business uh for the Pilates in the Pilates world and I took my, my friends with me and I'm like okay we're staying in this haunted place let's go over to Ireland and you know all of these haunted places and it was such a gas I mean it was just like we didn't didn't see anything but the stories that we were told and and the mm -hmm. way we went to one hotel in particular which I talk about and it on the show and it just makes me laugh it was on like Europe's most haunted one of those, you know, TV shows and oh. Kennedy Castle and, you know, just all the 
the drama and things. And when we checked in, you know, I, I had done some research and found out the most haunted room where the bride threw herself off the window, blah, 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 blah. And I asked for that room and, and everybody behind the desk, oh, no, you can't, you can't. Are you sure you want to stay in that room? Because the people that checked in last week just left in a hurry. And, you know, of course, of course, I'm going to stay in that room. You know, it was just like, oh. and then, you know, flash forward to later, 3 a.m., 3 a. 2 a.m., I'm having a, an Irish whiskey with, with the owner of the castle in front of the hearth. And, and he's just like, well, I really hate to tell you this, but, you know, we pretty much made made that story up for, to generate revenue. <laughs> oh, well, now that's interesting because that's not the first or the last time such a thing would happen. And um, later on, what we, as we rattle through some of the other pictures I sent you, I'll, I'll tell you a, a thing about a guy that's, was so famous for making up stories that there's a to this day there's a competition in, about lying in his honor but can, can i say a couple of things about um you did these couple of random experiences so i was first of all you've got to be careful what you say um casually because sometimes the, the best way to make up a story i discovered by accident very recently and i think i've known this anyway but i was just amazed this happened again so recently um is to sort of say something that's kind of half heard and then people go off with a particularly different take on it. So I don't think this will mean anything in the United States, but I'm going to discuss it at the ASAP conference. But um, this little radio show I've got, I, apropos of nothing, I got my hands on an MP3 of a song that was a hit in the 1970s, which I haven't heard in years. It grew out of a jeans commercial in the UK, a song called uh, Jeans On by David Dundas. And I just, as I was going to play this on the right on my show, I just Googled David Dundas because I thought, well, I don't know what the hell he did apart from that one single, right? Because he, he'd written it as an advertising jingle and it became so popular they turned it into a hit single in this country. And anyway, I was amazed to discover that David Dundas is not only still alive, but he's actually genuine British aristocracy, right? Oh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, you know, his dad was a Marquis or something. And, and now he's got the title because he's 78 years old. And I was just putting, just working on the show and listening to the stuff and whatever before we did the sort of links for it. And I commented to somebody else. Um, it suddenly just occurred to me, if you look at the, the lyrics of this song, like I wake up in the morning light, I put on my jeans and I feel all right. And then there's this line about I put my blue jeans on. And then there's another, there's a middle eight about you and me, I'll go motorbike riding and whatever, anyway. I, it, I don't know why it just it suddenly occurred to me i thought well if it's not jeans as in the jeans you wear it's the jeans you inherited i.e the jeans with a g suddenly this song takes on a completely different meaning mm. it's the aristocracy kind of giving it that to the rest of us you know and <laughs> <laughs> as in like you know i'm motorbike riding in the middle of the day while you poor people are working you know i put my blue jeans on and i feel okay and i sort of i commented i just made this casual comment that i won't name them because it's embarrassing for them but i made this casual comment to the person that was in the room with me about do you realize you can that song can mean the fuck there and it doesn't and anyway about two days later they came back and said so that's what it's really about and I'm like, no, it just occurred to me when I was looking at the lyrics. It's not at all. It just, it just, it just, you know, <laughs> I don't think he meant that. I think, you know, look, we can talk about this stuff all the time. It, it's important if you're putting a claim of the paranormal out to source it. Bottom line is that song started, provably started its life as a commercial for Brutus jeans in the UK, right? The whole point of the song was to sell pairs of jeans to young people, end up. So the fact that it was written by somebody who was British aristocracy is just completely coincidental. So yeah, you've got to be really, really careful about this kind of stuff, haven't you? Can I just have another rant and then we'll yeah. try and get back on track? So are you aware that there was a British scientist who came up with actually quite a plausible theory and did some laboratory tests about places where ghosts will appear and actually the model fits the kind of big haunted castles and stuff that are, you know, did, Ooh. So, look, we're about expanding frontiers research here. Let me chuck something in that your your followers can Google on this one. The guy's name was Vic Tandy, V-I-C, and then Tandy, T-A-N-D-Y. Long story short, he was working in a lab late one night, i.e. like the you know, Monster Bash song, yeah, right? Um, and he saw a ghost. 
and he knew two things right away. Number one, he had definitely seen what looked like a ghost. Number two, he didn't believe in ghosts. And not long after that, he had, he was, the other thing that Vic Tandy did was that he was a very keen competitive fencer, as in like, you know, with a, a foil like a sword, yeah? Mm -hmm. And he'd got his foil in a vice and he noticed that despite the fact that the vice had got it completely tight and he wasn't touching it, it was vibrating. Very long story short, he came up with a theory about this, which involved ultra low frequency sound waves, basically the kind of sound waves that would be trapped in a building after people had gone. So if he was alone in a laboratory that had been busy in the day and had been quite noisy, sound waves would be bouncing around that had originally started when the place was busier. They would slow down and slow down to the point where they'd interact with the moisture in the air, the water vapor in the air. And in certain circumstances, as the rooms cooled and the water vapor and the sound waves interacted, they would briefly create like fleeting mists. Uh, and he came up with this theory and he, he it was actually tested in a laboratory and it got a few, I mean, he got results to the point where he was actually able to put peer reviewed stuff out there and say, well, you can go and test this because I've actually, um, and it's, it's not as simple as I'm making it sound, but the point is that the kind of locations that would lend themselves to this happening perfectly yep. would be like castles with long corridors and all the rooms shut and things like that. Wow. Um, yeah. And one of the, the main reason that this is not better known is that just completely coincidentally, Vic Tandy, I think he published his paper when he was 47 or 48 and he died when he was nearly 51. So oh I know, yeah, and he wasn't, he, it, it wasn't that long ago. He, you know, he, it's, in other circumstances, it's plausible he'd still be alive today and still talking about it. But it's, um, yeah, it, we're expanding frontiers here. So you can hear all the ghost stories. You can go and Google that. And that that's actually, true. I'm going to. That's fascinating. Yeah. Huh. Thank you for... Thank you for going into that and stuff. I know we're getting a little bit off of track of what you wanted to talk about, but this is really good stuff. I like it. So thank you. Okay, should we do some punchy stuff and run through the slides and then we can have another long yeah. rant later on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So your next slide. Oh yeah. No, let me, let me do a shout out on this. So I've, I've got to be clear about this. The, uh, the mystery book is a co-authorship. So that's EK Knight, who's my co-author. Can I say two things about her? Yeah. Um, first of all, the um, it, it, I brought EK in to do this because when I she, she was originally one of my professional writing students and one of the more memorable people I ever taught actually because apart from anything else I'd set a, like some work for the class and then the next question to this one would be well how does that translate on your planet? She lives and breathes dark fantasy so. She actually takes, there's a point in the book where I just take a step back and let E.K. Knight come forward and talk about all of this and um, just explain that part of grappling with mystery sometimes is the life of the kind of people for whom living in a mysterious world is actually what they do most of the time. So when I talk about this live, I talk about E.K. Knight's work, I talk about a British author called Terry Pratchett who spent his whole time in, you know, the, in the fantasy world and I talk about the abstract expressionist artists people like um I've got a slide of a Clifford Steele painting for example but it, it it's it's an interesting thing because I know when I asked EK to do the little bit in the book there um I also asked a question about the fantasy that gets written the EK Knight writes and said well do you understand what it's about and the answer was well no I write it first <laughs> 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 almost like <laughs> there are these writers that can go to fantasy worlds and almost sort of stand in among it and then come back and report on what they say and last point about ek knight but um it's worth mentioning tonight because i just i just swapped a message before i came online with you so um ek is just had the latest knockback from a literary agent there is a dark fantasy dynasty out there to be discovered if you know if any of your viewers are literary agents or publishers of dark fantasy i can put you in touch oh, cool. you might be very grateful right. that i did yeah yeah i like it okay should, should we rock through a few more yeah yeah okay so oh now this is an interesting one so this is discussed in the mystery book but it's also a ufo event although very few ufo books talk about it just quite simply this is one of the things i was talking about in terms of our experience of mystery that is the 
that photograph is the crowd looking at the miracle of the sun at Fatima, Portugal in 1917. And, and it's an interesting mystery story because on the one hand, you've got a bunch of eyewitnesses who reliably and agreeably among themselves saw the sun perform things that would be physically impossible if the laws of physics are as we're told they are. And also there were other miracles reported like you know a rain shower and then miraculously clothing and other bits and pieces like the ground dried up. Now, what's interesting is that there is no photographic evidence of any of it actually being a, there's no photographic evidence that supports the paranormal claims, but it completely encapsulates the stuff I was telling you about earlier on, because by complete contrast to the photographic evidence, there are certain parts of the crowd where the majority of the eyewitnesses saw something miraculous and could not be persuaded otherwise. And that, that is such a, beautiful photo i mean there's so many this that photo has so much depth it does and wow. those people are engaging i mean they're looking at a miracle in the sky when they're being photographed and this I'm, put that back you know, it, the, 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 well, the, the point i'm making about the sincerity of witnesses but nobody's faking that that is a camera set up to look at the crowd the crowd aren't bothered about the camera because the miraculous is taking place in front of them wow. so they're yeah, the word you're looking for, I guess, is rapture, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. That, I mean, it's not really a posed photograph. It's an actuality photograph, which wouldn't be easy to take in 1917 because, you know, camera equipment was cumbersome. But then the one place you could take it is in, in a situation where people were so caught up with something else, they were oblivious to being photographed. Wow, that's a great photo. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then you've got the next. Yes. Well, yes. Yeah, so again, this is this is going back to our. There's a guy I quote in the book, Edward O. Wilson. Um, and Edward O. Wilson lived from 1929 to 2021, I think. Um, he's worth a Google again. He's he achieved loads of things. He's one of the things he's best known for in the UK is the fact that he's the guy that, co that coined the term biodiversity. But he talked about the fact that mankind currently has Paleolithic brains, medieval institutions, i.e. we're in countries and counties and stuff, and we have godlike technology. Our Paleolithic brains created this. This is one of the Lascaux cave paintings from um, France, and they're approximately 17,000 years old, give or take. Um, and it's just something I talk about in the book, because what things like this teach us is that our ability to engage with the mysterious and celebrate it is older than the recorded history we've got nobody was writing history at this point so our best guess is about what is going on with these cave paintings are simply guesses but there's quite compli complicated stuff here there's for example there's a pho photograph there's a painting of a, a wounded animal in the cave paintings and not only that but if you look at anything online about quite literally where these paintings are, i.e. how far they are under the ground. And then you think about the difficulty of creating something so complex away from light in 17,000 years ago. Um, so you're working by basically you're burning animal fat in a primitive wick. This is a colossal undertaking and it would only have been done because it was very meaningful to the people who did it. Now, whether they've got a ritual purpose or whether it's just for the purposes of just you know finding a space for a group of people to meet it's irrelevant we it's seventeen thousand years ago we needed to mankind was engaging with the uncanny on a massive scale even then i think you're muted <laughs> <laughs> i can't hear you erica sometimes it's better that way <laughs> great tv yeah. that, that, that's one the blooper reel <laughs> yeah. that, 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 that is the blooper reel that, that's the blooper reel gold yeah right you know how long my blooper bloopers would be it would be <laughs> yeah. i have to tell you one time this is funny i don't we did go off i just fool for one second but i did a show and i was playing with a new camera and i was interviewing somebody who is a bit older and he really doesn't know how technology you think i'm bad he doesn't know how technology works and so he's he's calling from his car he's on in his car and he's on his phone and he can't hear anything and so he decides that he's gonna basically take a picture of his crotch <laughs> so he's like, <laughs> 
Oh dear. You know, and then and then if he did, like he turned it around, and then you know it's like his him from the bottom up, and so it's like, <laughs> and then oh, a picture of his hand on the steering wheel, and I'm sitting there with you know because he can't hear me, so I'm writing cue cards. I mean, it was like. Yeah, you know, that talk about blooper reels, and that's that's a good idea. Thank you for inspiring me. I should put that together. <laughs> okay. well, actually, but the the thing if you make a blooper is to just I've, I've I spotted a while ago my camera shots, it, it's the wrong way around. So I'm um yeah, it's definitely the wrong. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. It's um the left and right is wrong, but it, I, I just continue like it's not it's nothing, right? It, I haven't <laughs> noticed it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for letting me go off on that. Okay, then yeah. you've got this picture of Ellen. Oh, yes. So th th this is something else about that I just discussed. And actually, I, I talk about this in my in my live talks. I do, a, I do a live talk on Elvis, which isn't really about his career. It's about other things. But um, just in terms of how we make mystery, this I would say this is an example of mysterious stuff that that's going on in the present day there's a there's a story in the why mystery matters book which i, I spend a bit more time talking about live where it probably it's probably better known in the united states the the work of raymond moody who's still alive isn't he but he's um <laughs> raymond moody may be one guy that's looking forward very much to the end of his life because he spent most of his life researching life after death hasn't he yeah um, <laughs> so he's easier go to for that but there's um in a book called Elvis Afterlife, which it discusses various afterlife encounters with Elvis, there is a story uh, of a, a, a young woman. She's about, I've forgotten how old she was when she died, about maybe 20. Um, she had Down syndrome and she had the kind of Down syndrome that gives you horrific heart problems. So she was never going to live very long. She was the daughter of absolute diehard Elvis fans and just once earlier in her life. Um, she'd attended an Elvis gig and when she died in 1980, so she was passing in and out of consciousness and talking when she came back round and was having the kind of, was describing the classic, you know, sort of almost like the, what you'd expect people to be seeing when they're about to pass down mm -hmm. the tunnel. And her last, um, her last words were that Elvis was here. She didn't meet St. Peter, she met Elvis. Right now, I don't know. Um, you could see that just as somebody seeing what they'd expect to see. Um, we, we, can we come back to it later as to yeah. what I might think yeah. about all of these? Because it's I've got hunches which I can't stand up because I think the evidence that we'd need to stand these things up is just so far away from any scientific proof but I've got I've got notions about what might be going on there with Elvis and some of the UFO stuff yeah yeah all right cool okay then your slide oh yeah okay so <laughs> <Can I just, laughs> this is interesting <laughs> well it is yeah so I, I took that photograph after a football match so it's a it's a British pub I, Americans know who Boris Johnson is right yes yeah he's he's the new uh somebody in the uk um i think quite accurately summed up some of the boris johnson sort of personas they describe him as a pound shop trump yeah i.e yep. basically he's a dime store donald trump you know <laughs> <laughs> and so but no the, the, I, I, I talk about this in the in the live gigs but this is this is one thing about why mystery matters very very simply i would say that for most of us who've grappled with the mysterious over our lives sometimes one of the payoffs is that if you spend a lot of time trying to figure something out and you do all the logical thinking occasionally the answer will emerge in an illogical way right it will just come to you very rapidly and the reason it does is because you've spent so much time thinking about it it's just going to emerge now there's quite serious examples in the book to do with um you know the discovery of discovering the chemical composition of benzene is quite an interesting story because the person who did it probably dreamed part of it yeah and then realized what the dream meant i had a very similar but much more down market experience in a pub which is why i've got a picture of a pub i was going to a football match i guess what you americans some of you still insist on calling soccer um <laughs> <laughs> we invented it. Okay, okay. <laughs> How dare you take rugby and call it football? Now we are here. Football. You see, the rules of association football, 1863. It's British, right? 
Um, and originally the Scots were better at it than the English. That's another story. But I was before a football match. Like this, guys, I go to football with on a regular basis, and we know each other reasonably well. But what we share is football and the experience around it. So in other ways, our lives are very different. And long story short, but I was buying a drink at the bar, and one of the guys I've been going with for years just we were just having a bit of a joke at the bar while my drink was arriving, and he said to me, more or less, he said that my work in life was his idea of hell. Um, and what by which he meant sitting alone in a room and trying to think things up and then getting in front of groups of people and talking about him would terrify him, right? right? So we had a bit of a laugh and you know agreed very quickly that I'd be terrible at what he does because he drives a train. Um, <laughs> I'd be in the news as a train driver, but for all the wrong reasons, I just get distracted. But I said to him in the moment, I said, to, You just don't get it, Rob. I said. I've suffered from ideas my whole life and all I've ever done is get to places when I'm working where that affliction is useful right and we had a laugh about it and you know and that was that but I was heading home after that game and I thought you know what that is absolutely it all the the amount of time I've spent in rooms with people saying you really want to be spending your money on you know you want to be publishing this book you want to be spending your money on that idea because this is where it's going to go no actually I suffer from ideas um, now, it's interesting because I'd spent a lot of time, people often ask you if you do something for, and I'm with UFOs, right? People ask you, well, why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty much well, all day, every day, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, <laughs> well, it's not, uh, oh, we'll, we'll agree. It's not to do with the group, it's, it's not to do with the money, it's not to do with the respect of your fellow citizens, and it's probably not to do with career advancement in terms of exactly <laughs> why. <laughs> so there's got to be a reason. And it's the same with writing, you know, like he's in, what the hell makes you want to do that? And the truth is, yes, I suffer from ideas, and I won't bore you with the ins and outs, but I'm married to a psychotherapist, and I've spent a fair few years understanding things about myself that I probably wouldn't have done unless I'd married somebody who did that for a living. And I kind of get it now. There's somewhat unusual circumstances around my birth that probably explain a bit of it. Um, but I, yeah, I genuinely suffer from ideas and it's just, you know, and that was, I kind of came to that realization as a result of years of grappling with it. And then just a random answer, not in a logical way, but it, that, it was a, it was a kind of, private little moment of revelation for me when that happened and it, it's probably was one of the most positive unexpected experiences of my life and that was you know about sort of 15 years ago so um i'd had a lot of stuff published and done a lot of professional writing before i knew why the hell i was bothering to do it <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh that's awesome okay so that's do it now we're out this is gonna be good so wh why do you do ufos <laughs> me yeah I have let, 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 let's, let's lose this slide for a minute okay. that's a serious quick you know if, if if you'd been at that bar and my mate robert said your working life is my idea of hell why would you spend your life grappling with the paranormal and why would you have your show and why would you do everything else that you do around it what's the answer you know what i mean and, and that's a great question that i ask myself every night when i'm standing here looking at thousands upon thousands of, of UFO books. It's like, God, why? Please, I want to have a religious experience now to explain the, you know, the path that I'm I am on. I think, you know, I I genuinely really I love I love mystery. I love the unknown. I love the idea of there being something more that we can discover or something that we won't discover that will, you know, intermittently come into our lives and 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 interact and shape us and and leave us wanting more and so i i, I loved that the, the more i've gotten into the ufo topic and done some significant historical research and looking into people involved in the topic it's become a very um it hasn't been a very empowering place like it used to be in the same sense it's become empowering from the sense now that I have an understanding of the motivations of a lot of the people that are pulling the strings. Mm. So that's, it's been an, it's been a transformation, you know, like we were talking about how we both kind of went from, you know, this, this point in the beginning of, of our travels around these topics. And then we end up um, at a different, different point. And so I guess now I'm doing it because I feel 
that way. Well, I love talking to people. That's just, <laughs> I love hearing people's stories and, and, and just learning things uh, about other people and about the universe, whatever. But I also feel that there, I have a sense of, because I have a show and because I do lectures and I have a, a, you know, nonprofit that I have a platform to teach people about being more thorough and asking questions and demanding answers. So people aren't led down rabbit holes that aren't in the best interest for them mentally. Mm. Well, I totally get that. I mean, I, I made a, what sounded like quite a flippant remark to somebody the day that, that they laughed at, but I, I stand by it that there's been moments in my career of researching the paranormal and particularly UFOs and, and you know, writing about it and everything where I've learned so much about my fellow human beings that the alleged aliens almost seem like they're irrelevant. Right. Um, and yeah, I, so I, no, I, I totally get that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So sorry for putting you on the spot, Erica. It's your job, isn't it? You're supposed to be doing that to me. So we... <laughs> no, I like it. You're keeping me on my toes. It's okay, good. right. Should, should we go back to that, that other slide? Because this, yeah. this was another moment of revelation for me. Um, so, yeah, this is this is the work of a guy who goes under the name of Cat Neil. And um, this was just a – I'd spent ages – I was actually writing – I'd written the previous UFO book, and I was working on the mystery book, and I was just – having a walk by the seafront not far from where i live one day and cat neil lives in a place that's known in the uk as the isle of thanet it's not actually an island it used to be but it's not anymore uh and his epic scale graffiti which has grinning cats that look like they're on some class a substance right <laughs> um, and uh, using messages about you know the the cosmos being alive or some variation thereof and you know ufos spinning around i just i spotted one of them and it just it it it, it had never occurred to me all the time i'd spent ufo researching and stuff that actually one of the best ways of communicating this is in is graffiti that's on an epic scale there's a little discussion about it in the book a long story short it was not easy it involved chasing a bunch of people who might just know and i eventually met him <laughs> yeah Wow. He's a little bit like Banksy, so you see his yep, work, yep. but most people wouldn't, if you passed him in the street, most people wouldn't know. Um, and actually, it's on the to-do list next week that I'm taking him a copy of the mystery book because of that picture's in it. <laughs> That's cool. Wow. That's it is, yeah. I've, I've got a, it's, you, you don't just sort of go and, you know, you, you don't just go and ask for Cat Neil, but I, I know where to find him now. So I'm, I'm taking him the book or being well on Tuesday. In, in Banksy, we had a we had a Banksy sighting. We had a Banksy pop up in uh, Park City. Oh, really? Was yeah. it a genuine Banksy? Yeah. All right. It's pretty it cool. Gets around. I mean, it's it's a it's an interesting way to make a living. I'd say he started as a graffiti artist really before the internet was a big thing. So um, he's celebrated in this country. Number one, as one of our most interesting living artists, and number two, as a guy that was unquestionably ahead of his time yeah but i, I love cat neil stuff when i see a new one down on the isle of thana it's like oh yes <laughs> well, that is, i'm gonna have to plug it again you've given me new things to to look into it's got a facebook page i mean clearly the facebook page doesn't give you his name and address it doesn't it doesn't give you a but there is a facebook page that celebrates his work yeah cool it, it's cat neil all one word with a capital c and a capital n okay and it's not the, be clear he might call himself neil but he's he's, he's not me <laughs> it is okay. definitely not me sure. <laughs> two of us have been in a room together there were two people <laughs> definitely yeah. that's what they all say <laughs> yeah there were witnesses yeah but okay. um yeah and, and it, it took a friend of a friend to put us in touch he was he was not easy to he was easy to find but he was not easy to identify how interesting well, that'll be right. fun to meet him that's cool yeah that is cool. Okay, so well, if it goes public, oh, this this is an all walk for me. That's um, there's a rock band hidden in those lights. So again, it, sorry, just just to make the the, the point, it's because it's made in the mystery book about why this stuff is good for us. Those, those most of us, even if we spend our lives absolutely shackled by, you know, the demands of work, and Americans talk about it as working for the man, don't they? Yeah. Um, you know, even if we spend a lot more time than we want to do in that, and even if we're sort of in 
kind of tied to internet silos a lot of the time. I just use this as when I'm talking about it as an example of how we we just an everyday thing can completely overrule you. So I mean that's I blatantly took that photograph when I'm in you know I'm, I'm watching a band on stage. That's a that's a British band called Hawkwind who and I love partly because um, when you go to a Hawkwind gig you don't really watch Hawkwind you kind of get lost in the experience. They're they're pre rave and all that kind of dance culture stuff but they were always dwarfed by their own light shows to the point where there are five musicians there but you don't you can't see them and the point is not to see them the point is to be just absolutely overwhelmed by them you know and I'm I'm, look, I'm I'm seeing them again in a few weeks time which I'm really looking forward to that sounds like a blast I need to get out and hear some music I'm I really yeah. I need to do that more often than I do. And I totally skipped over because clearly I'm bad on the slides here in the order, but I skipped over. Oh, this. do you recognize this guy? Well, I mean, I would imagine that would be the Dalai Lama. No, no, that. Well, I mean, Matteo, it's, that, that's Matteo Ricard. Um, that's your, well, I clearly fail on that one. I'm, I've got to edit right. that part out. <laughs> no, it's interesting whether he'd ever want to be a Dalai Lama. I mean, he couldn't be because he, he the Dalai Lama reincarnates. So the fact that he and Matteo Ricard are alive at the same time means he that can't could be a little awkward. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine the two competing Pope scenario, but two competing Dalai Lamas would mean that neither of them could be right. Yeah. I mean, it would defeat the whole thing, wouldn't it? Mind yeah. Blowing. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, actually, that's not strictly true. But it, but it, if 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 a Dalai Lama reincarnates two times, that's just anyway. Um, <laughs> Matteo Ricard disputes the claim that's made about him, which is the claim is that he's the world's happiest man. Uh, the evidence for the world's happiest man is that the brain scans that have been done of him uh, indicate that he's got, effectively, he has been scanned as having a happier brain than any other person whose brain was ever scanned. And he's an, he's an interesting case study in as much as he's a combination of literally what you'd expect for the happiest brain he is a buddhist monk and he meditates sometimes you know he does nothing much else in a day but meditate on the other hand he's got a phd in something hideously clever in terms of chemical science yeah he's also a photographer and he uses an apple mac and he's got an online presence yeah wow now, well okay but I would just hold this guy in terms of why does mystery matter and what can we learn about paranormal experience and all the other things. I'm more and more interested as I go forward in finding these examples where you're presented with something you can't deny, but it's a challenge to the really simple answers. And your man, Matteo Ricard, is exactly that. Um, because the whole point about his happy brain is that this is what he's achieved as a result of taking a swerve from what would have been a very complicated scientific career and combining a bit of what he knows with what he wants to do, which is basically to be a Buddhist monk. But on the other hand, it's not like he, he sees the isolation of meditation as a, an end in itself. So he does actually engage with people and, you know, and he's attended, I know he's attended major world events. I might be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure that he went to the world economic forum at Davos at one point yeah oh interesting yeah well yeah very interesting because I'm, I'm assuming that if he's sitting in a room with four guys who've got private jets he's probably got a fairly robust opinion about you know he and bill gates would be an interesting uh, conversation wouldn't it yeah that would be wow yeah. i mean would. that's not a thing that you just pop into <laughs> no no it's not but but you know, we're, we're expanding frontiers here, right? So the whole yes. point about Matteo Ricard is you can Google him. You can Google the case study of what was this, I literally the MRI of his brain. And you can Google the conversations about why he might have the happiest brain that was ever scanned. And again, his opinions about, unsurprisingly, number one, he dismisses the notion of being the world's happiest person. Number two, his take on that is that it's it, it's irrelevant anyway. You know, uh, he's not there to be. It's, it's not a championship. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. It's, and and he'd probably if if you turned being the happiest person on earth into a championship, he'd probably you'd probably immediately make him very unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> but 
No, but seriously, it's 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 a completely different mindset. But the point is that any claim I'm making about him here is supported by peer-reviewed science, which anybody watching your show could actually go and check out. Okay. I, I'm going to be busy later tonight. I have a feeling. <laughs> so, okay. Well, that's that's the, surely that's the point of your show, isn't it? That yes. If, if, if your diehard viewers are not busy after a show, then you know, get a guest on or make them busy. Yeah. Now, this is a, this guy is a local hero. I obviously I never met this guy, but we were talking earlier on. I said I'd, I'd say about you know sort of storytelling and about creative brains and everything like that. Um, we've kept alive. I we've been storytellers. Human, our brains in terms of how we experience the more kind of cultural sides of our brains. So I talked earlier on about the you know the mind mapping that people have done when. Uh, people like Dan Levitin have been examining how we experience music, yeah? Yep. But on a very mundane level, we've been great storytellers. And I mean, this, this, the, the guy you're looking at is a guy called Will Ritson, and he was a landlord. He ran a pub. Uh, I'm from a place called Cumbria in the United Kingdom. Um, it's one of the more rural counties. And amongst other things, we have a quite, we have a tradition. This, this, what I'm going to say now sounds kind of counterintuitive but we're proud liars we lie to kids a lot yeah yep. and the whole point of telling kids whopping lies is to make them very critical thinkers and I had a kind of yes moment when I was reading a biography of James Dean who was did James Dean grow up in Fairmount Indiana am I remembering that right something like that I don't know but yeah I can't remember yeah it's it's somewhere very rural isn't it he grew, he grew up on a rural farm in in you know effect, effectively in the Midwest in the United states and i discovered something in that biography where there is a local liars championship where he grew up and it's the same as where i grew up that what what i'm about to tell you sounds ironic but it's not the best liars and the people who win the championship are often also local historians they're the people who's you know whose life is about knowing the truth <laughs> yeah. now Will Ritson was a landlord in the 19th century in a rural English location, a beautiful place surrounded by lakes and mountains. And when the railways opened up the country, one thing that happened up there was that very rich people from the southeast of England, from London, started coming up to climb the mountains and they needed to stay in places. And Will Ritson became famous for the lies he told to these tourists and the amount of times they believed this sort of stuff, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like the David Dundas story I told you about, you know, the blue jeans thing. Well, Will Ritson was an absolute master of this art, which is why we celebrate him to this day. So, for example, um, he made some people, some tourists believe that turnips, which are the vegetables, turnips, that in Cumbria, the, the turnips grew so big that when they got the biggest ones, they used to cut holes in them and keep cattle in them to keep them out of the rain. Right. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> people fell, fell for this stuff. So um, there, to this day, in the in the Santon Bridge Inn, where Will Ritson was landlord nearly 200 years ago now, um, there is a World Liars Championship, and every year they do this. They get the you know, and and they award prizes for the best stories. Uh, and there's there's a wonderful. Uh, this is probably what I'm what, what I'm going to tell you now probably isn't true but the, uh, god I wish this was true there is a story that well during Will Ritson's lifetime no actually a little bit later than that the World Liars Championship was taking place on a hot day so instead of having it in the pub they'd all come outside onto the village green and they were telling the stories and a carriage a horse and carriage went by and the guy in the in the carriage was the bishop the local bishop right um, and he didn't know what was going on, so he stopped. And somebody explained to him, oh, well, we do this every year. It's a World Liars. It's our Liars Championship. And he was horrified. And he, he admonished them about lying and everything. And then he said, you know, pointed out this was ungodly. And he said, and I've never told a lie in my life. And the story is that somebody picked up the trophy and chucked it in his carriage and they awarded him the prize right there, you know. <laughs> um, but, Sorry, but the point about why, why would I talk about that in a mystery book and why would I bring it up? Because there is a va we experience a lot of positive emotions sharing the most uncanny, amazing stories. Yeah. Yeah. And there's points to this. And one point which we often lose is that if we just take the stories as stories and then engage with them, 
it's the way that mankind has learned critical thinking for years. And look, I'll, I'll cop for this as a as a Cumbrian. I lied to my kids as they were growing up. It doesn't mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not apologizing for that. I told my four year old one time we're feeding ducks on a pond. Right. And all the ducks are coming over to get the bread and everything like that. And I said to him, oh, they're floating really well today, you know, and didn't think anything. I said, you know, it's the bread that makes them float. You've got to keep that you know, right. <laughs> So and I, 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 then I told him that if we went down there at six o'clock in the morning before anybody else went down, all you'd see was a beak sticking out of the water, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you have to put the bread in the duck's beak, and then when it gets two bits of bread, it comes up out of the water slowly. <laughs> anyway, that that one worked because the following morning at about half past five, he's trying to pull the duvet off me. <laughs> he, wants, he wants to see these, but you know, it's and I'm not apologising for that. It's, <laughs> There's an overlap in terms of the paranormal thing, and it's quite simply that if you take stories as stories and apply your critical thinking, actually, it's the best way to develop your critical brain. And we don't tend to do it with things like the Roswell case. You just tend to, or ancient aliens, you're encouraged to just take that at face value. Right. Um, but actually, you know, it's not a million miles away. Look, that is funny we should mention Roswell, yeah? Funny. Funny, yeah, that's Jesse Marcel, isn't it? Um, yes. Go on, what, what's your? T I'll I'll finish my tea. What's your take on Roswell, Erica? Well, I think it was a good story. Yeah, I'd agree with that. What happened? You know, you know what? I, I think Barry Greenwood has done has done a great you know job on that, and I think Brad Sparks. And I mean, I just don't think it was. I mean, obviously, it wasn't what they said it was. That was a, a distraction campaign. Um, and then back in the 80s, people like Stanton Friedman decided to climb back in and, and reinvigorate a story and find people and pull them out of the woodwork. And so it was just, it wasn't much. And then it was something in the 80s and continues to be to this day. Yeah. All right. Well, exactly. So if we lose Jesse Marcel, let me have a rant about Roswell because it, it's, it, this is the other side of the world liars championship i think it matters and this is you know the kind of trip i'm on these days really that i want to apply critical thinking i want to stand things up as somebody who's been a journalist and then an academic most of my work in life it's second nature to stand these things up and i'm totally with you on the roswell thing that for me there's a frustration in this that i'm old enough now that i see this same stories coming round again and it, and it I'm just it bothers me that we don't use critical thinking a lot of the time so for example with Roswell I think that just it's the biggest story and one thing I see missing the whole time these days when when they did the 75th anniversary uh, I was promoting my UFO book at the time and when I was on the Martin Willis show I mean you know, I spoke about what I, I believed and everything. And the first person who called in called me a moron on the basis that I didn't believe the Roswell story. And, you know, from my point of view, it's it, it's become second nature now that if if we're going to learn something, well, you need to, it's dialectic, you know, what you do in, in academia. You collide competing arguments until each one knocks the, basically knocks the, incredible out of the other one and then what you're left with is the closest to the truth in it and you know it bothers me first of all i'll just chuck this out there and again you, you know if your viewers don't know this then go and google it there was a thing called the fund for ufo research that exit that was most active in the late 90s and early 20, 21st century right mm -hmm. they never spent more money or more man hours than on any case than roswell yeah and the reason they did that, the fund for UFO research is what people would have thought it was. It was to get as much money together as you can, do serious UFO research. The point of this is they're not being open minded. They're going, they're looking for the cases that will most convince the people that they call skeptics, scientists and stuff like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And when Carl Flock was sent by the fund for UFO research to investigate Roswell, that was a watershed moment for me because First of all, the case falls apart in front of him, right? You know, the witnesses aren't credible. Frank Kaufman signs three affidavits because the first two just shredded in terms of the investigation. Um, Glenn Dennis, who I always thought was the most credible witness, actually 
they can't find the nurse he was going out with who told him about the alien and, and there's loads of stuff like that and also it, it just it bothers me now that um you know there are certain things that come up with roswell where sometimes i think i'm looking at an answer and then the documentary or whatever just takes a swerve so the i think it's in uh, the first witness they talk about jesse marcel don't they yeah there's a, there's a there was a tv series 75 years after roswell they've almost trolled the barrel they've scraped the barrel you know <laughs> but, but every time you think well look the, the one the one confident prediction i'll make is that when you think there are no more barrel scrapings to be had somebody will find them um so um <laughs> but in, in the jesse marcel one they, they talked a lot about his claims they the, the stuff hidden in plain sight you never hear jesse marcel interviewed with a strong voice right every time he's interviewed he's dying of emphysema right he died in 86 or something yeah i believe so yeah when he went to the national Enquirer in this 1970s which i think is the first place he went they were putting up a hundred thousand dollars in the 70s which would be worth a heck of a lot more money these days for ufo proof right and some of the cases that are durable to this day like the travis walton fire in the sky went to the national Enquirer first right yeah mm -hmm. jesse marcel was involved with them at one point again when you look at his home which is filmed in roswell the first witness it's not a sumptuous big place i mean he was a, he was an intelligence officer right uh he didn't go on to have a stellar career afterwards did he or live in a you know he, he his highest in some ways his most successful period was when he was actually in the army air force um and working as an intelligence officer so I can think of reasons, particularly to do with money, why that claim, why he might have taken that claim forward at that time, because he was already an ill man and he'd spent most of his working life as a TV repairman, hadn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And I know in the middle of that series, they go to. If anybody films at the landing site at Roswell, UFO hunters or whoever, at no point does anybody turn around to the camera and say, "Well, this is one of several claimed landing sites." Yeah. <laughs> they're always at the landing site aren't they and yet, <laughs> just, just 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 do basic bloody research on this if you took freeze frames of every documentary that ever filmed at the land at the landing site and then look at the scenery around them they're not all in the same place yeah the hills are different it's awkward, right? isn't it <laughs> you know which is and so, man, sorry I'll get, i could run forever on this one but i like it um, all right but um in the Carl Flock book, right, which discusses this, even if you didn't read the book, you've only got to open the flyleaf because there's a map there with different landing sites on it. Yeah. You know, big, <laughs> right. Now, the one place that everybody's agreed on, the one location that is beyond dispute is more or less where the debris field was on the Brazil Ranch. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody knows where the Brazil Ranch was. More or less, everybody knows where. Jesse Marcel, Sheridan Cabot, and uh, Mac Brazel picked up the first lot of debris, right? Although, interestingly, when Carl Flock does his research in 1997 or thereabouts, in the mid 1990s, um, Jesse Marcel's dead. Sheridan Cabot is not dead. He's still alive. He's the counterintelligence officer who went along with Jesse Marcel, the intelligence officer. Sheridan Cabot's story is consistent throughout. They picked up something mysterious, but there was never any question. It was whatever the hell it was. It was some strange earthbound thing. Yeah, it's, his story is completely consistent with Mogul Balloon Launch Volume Number Four, which is in the book that's written by the three people, including Charles E. Moore, about the making of a modern myth at Roswell. Um, one of the three authors is Charles E. Moore, who went on to have a significant academic career. But in 1947, he was a um he was a research student working on project mogul he helped to launch balloon number four now i've struggled through that book because bloody hell there's about five pages about the properties of neoprene balloons yeah <laughs> what that guy didn't know about balloons is not worth knowing is it but um, <laughs> but on the other hand um i know that in i think it, again i think it might be well be the first witness the the 75th anniversary documentary they go with a metal detector and ground penetrating radar over the Brazil ranch site 
And one thing they find which they don't dig up is a mysterious object under the ground. But the metal detector doesn't find it. The ground penetrating radar does find it. And they hear when they're doing a video conference, they hear the one thing they don't want to hear, which is that the expert at the other end says, well, it might actually be a chunk of neoprene. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, sorry, just ran almost over on this, but maybe, again, I'm just I'm deliberately chucking this stuff out there because if you if your viewers want to go and Google this, they can you know there's names and stuff I've put in there where they can go and check it out. You know, the the Karl Flock book is still out there, and it, it's German spelling of Flock in it, so it, it actually starts with a P. But um, a, a few questions I would ask about Roswell. Number one, then they've been over the whole ground there around the Brazil ranch and everything like that right it's been combed so much if they didn't recover if Mac Brazel and um, Jesse Marcel and Sherilyn Cabot didn't recover Project Mogul's fourth balloon launch where the hell is the balloon right because so many people have been over that ground if there were traces of that balloon left somebody would have found something Therefore, it is completely plausible that the fourth mogul balloon launch came down on the Brazil Ranch, and that explains it. Yeah. All yeah. right. And the, the other thing that bothers me these days, and you know, this is why we should just look at these mysteries, I think, and just grapple with them rather than say, well, rather than use the confirmation bias approach. You know, we're dragging things in the whole time to give it some to make entertaining TV. What Brian Dunning calls edutainment. Yeah. And what you know has been known as infotainment for years, um, and I mean recently the um, oh was it the the final resolution the, the other big documentary series that came out seventy five years after Roswell, they had experts on who used this facial you know, the, the facial the the computer scanning of the face to tell whether you're telling the truth right. Mm -hmm. They had experts on about that and they talked in detail about well you, this is not simple you've got to train to use this equipment. And this is the same equipment that your border force people are using to spot drug smugglers and stuff like that yeah right well great and there and it, it said what you expected when they applied this to in to witness statements and people like jesse marcel you know the the computer scanning the face said well they're telling the truth and a lot of people fell for that but well i have a problem with that so just take a pause here right i have a problem with that because number one it completely disregards two things it disregards the fact that there's peer-reviewed evidence that a lot of the claims about this technology are spurious because actually for example if this is provable um a lot of the airports that brought it in a few years ago have taken it away because it's no better than chance at spotting drug smugglers and people with weapons right mm -hmm. and therefore it might be cheaper than using people, but if it can't stop the drugs and the weapons, it's useless, right? So we've gone back to, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, and secondly, with regard to that, at no point in that documentary, when they're talking about the fact that these people on camera are telling the truth, that they talk about how people are interviewed. So, I mean, you know, when I do pieces to camera and stuff like that, you've done this, right? Yep. You know your stuff. <laughs> To the point where you can rant about it as you've just spotted me doing now right <laughs> but on the other end in the moment you're not thinking do i believe jesse marcel was telling the truth or any such thing what you're thinking about is that there's a producer or an interviewer stood just about there out of shot and you want to keep them happy right and you've taken it once or twice already so your mind at that moment is focused on being convincing for them. They've already put you at your ease, right? Well, then any technology scanning you for telling the truth, right, will more likely say that you're telling the truth than not because you've already rehearsed it. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so I've chucked a lot of stuff out there, which is why I don't believe the claims, the more popular claims about Roswell. You know, and anybody can go and Google that and do their own investigation of it. But it's kind of it's it's brought me to you know that's the big case that fell apart for me and was it was disillusioning at the end of the 1990s but probably did me a favor in terms of making me more critically minded more open-minded and brought me to thinking more about the fact that we're dealing just with big mysteries than we are about anything else i mean i've got 
I have ideas about that. We should maybe where we should finish on that, but um, I can't prove any of the ideas. It's just it's stuff that's going to motivate me for the rest of my life. I think. So, what are your ideas? So, if I've come to any conclusions, there'd be this. First of all, um, that I think in terms of explaining the paranormal, I think that we probably delude ourselves in thinking that we've even asked the right questions yet. I think I think we've actually been blinded by a lot of the things that we believe. Um, and I think underneath that, there's a lot of consistency. So if you think about accounts of beings from the fairy world in two or 300 years ago, and UFO accounts now, the same things happen, right? In some of the more popular and well-known um, abduction accounts, for example, people try to take things off the UFOs and bring them home, don't they? Mm -hmm. Or yes. let's go for a better one. Joe Simonton and his pancake in the early 1960s, right? The Eagle River one, which is one of my favorite cases. There's no doubt he was sincere. I think Alan Harnick met him, didn't he? And Alan Harnick was convinced that Joe Simonton was telling him a sincere story. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've met people who've had the most uncanny experiences and they're not lying. But on the other hand, Joe Simonton was in possession of a pancake that you or I could have made. Yeah. It was nothing. Spectacular. You know what? Barry Greenwood actually has that a piece of that pancake. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. But yeah. It, it, it's, it, we can, we can agree. It's a pancake. It, it pretty much it's not looking super good now, yeah. but. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So how I explain this in the mystery book, it's, I explain it. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, one of the, the best jokes in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, this supercomputer made by these super intelligent pan galactic beings. They ask it the meaning of life and it gives them the answer. And the answer is 42. Yeah, right? Yeah. Which is a, right, okay. And then most people miss the context of that, which is that the computer then says, but you didn't ask the right question. I can help you put the question together, right? And that's one of the best gags in the whole Hitchhiker's Guide series because um, the computer they build to ask the ultimate question is the Earth. And before it can answer the question, it gets demolished to make way for the traffic system, right? Um, so, and I, I actually think that's that, I think there's a lot of truth in that joke. I think that actually one thing that I'm increasingly convinced of is that we're a lot more ignorant than we think we are. And actually there are patterns underneath this which are consistent. But finding anything more nuanced than that is really, really difficult. So with all due respect to the thousands of UFO books that surround you and me, right? Yeah, they're yeah. great. But we still, so I'm, I, I think now increasingly that a lot of the stuff that I believed when I was younger, I mean, I did myself a favor. When I was 13, I read George Adamski's Flying Sources of Landed or his bit of it, you know, and from that point, I had some skepticism. <laughs> yeah, but it was. It, but people should read this stuff. I mean, go back. I, I would advise your listeners, your, your 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 viewers and listeners, to go back and read the kind of ufology from the 1960s. You know, the Brad Steiger books. Because apart from anything else, where the hell is Roswell in those? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. All right. Happened in 1947. It was reported, including that press release. Right. But actually, it's until the Roswell incident book in 1980, it's nowhere really. Um, so first of all, I'm convinced of that. Secondly, I'm increasingly attracted to, and I don't know what the answers are here, but the stuff I read and find really exciting is the kind of fringe scientific stuff. And my, my background's humanity, so I kind of get quantum theory. You know, I get that it, this is about how energy coalesces and how it works and how, but there are clearly answers in that and I'm, I'm much more attracted now to um the kind of extreme ends of science and stuff so for example an absolute scientific outlier is a guy called gerard tooft he's 75 you can google this guy again he's clearly no slouch because he's got a nobel prize but he's done what most nobel prize winners have done which is i didn't know there was such a thing as it, it, i've heard it referred to as nobelitis right it's mm. a disease that affects nobel prize winners the second they've got a Nobel Prize and they know they can get a research grant for almost anything, they start doing the stuff they care about, right? Right, that makes sense. Now, he's 
an outlying advocate of a thing called super determinism and such as my scientific friends have, have told me they don't believe he's right um but super determinism is a kind of extreme end of chaos theory where almost like every lepton in the universe is related to every other lepton it crudely we're back to cat neil the universe is alive yeah Mm -hmm. It's an interesting theory because if you take it to one extent, and you know, I find this really attractive, but I don't, I don't believe it's necessarily true. But it's a fantastic idea because effectively, it's the notion that there might be just some super consciousness which can communicate with us. Now, at least that that fits in a very simple way for me. So it fits because it gives a consistency to things. It suggests that every sincere witness might actually be telling you what they experienced. But in some cases, it might be akin to them interacting with some kind of cosmic consciousness, but only being able to understand it in a way that made sense with them, right? So in that case, you do die and meet Elvis, right? And there might be something more to it than just your own imagination. But that doesn't mean that everybody's going to die and meet Elvis, yeah? It's just part of a, an awakening consciousness. Now, that I find a really attractive idea. So it kind of spurs me on because I'd like to read the sort of stuff and find out the kind of stuff that makes that possible. The other thing, and this is sort of the end of the rant on this one, I'm absolutely convinced that the only way to get proper answers about the paranormal is that you take everything that can explain what you're dealing with and use it to explain what it can. And we don't do anywhere near enough of that, particularly exactly. in ufology, right? the best ufologists who deal with ufo witnesses and stuff the whole time tend not to be remotely engaged with the sociologists the psychologists that are studying why people believe this stuff right and they should be because actually it's explaining a lot of it you know yeah. um and that's been going on for years there was i remember reading something ages ago which i can't find anymore there was a the master's degree thesis from the mid 1970s on um by a guy called stephen p rester Hmm. Um, and it's it was the point is that it was for the time it was cutting edge and there was a British equivalent as well of somebody who did the same sort of thing but it was looking at the extent to which the people who were most interested and most ex most likely to experience had what they call an external locus of control they experienced their lives as being controlled so they were more likely to believe the kind of conspiratorial stuff because actually life had told them that yeah, in the same way that they didn't distrust their bosses, basically. Um, so my take on it would be, if we're serious about finding answers, you should go to the increasing amount of fringe academic publishing, which is actually sticking stuff up that stand, withstands peer review. And then if you go through all of that, and there's stuff left in the middle that nobody can begin to explain, like the wow signal, which for my money is still the most intriguing suggestion of extraterrestrial life that humanity's encountered then if you go through all of these things and you are left with things that genuinely don't even begin to be touched by those claims then that's the stuff you should be investigating because that's the really interesting stuff okay yep Randy, did somebody just say great guest tonight yeah <laughs> yes that was scott so he's okay, yeah no <laughs> I, I just like those moments i'll go and tell my wife <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, in this, you know, and I love watching the, the comments and chat and everybody's just been, yeah, I mean, just listening to you and I, I you're, you're fascinating because you're, it's refreshing to hear somebody with, with different thoughts. And then I know I'm definitely, I'm going to be getting your book tonight, maybe more than one of your books, because, you know, okay. you know, I mean, the, let's talk about, so good, yeah. Let's yeah. Talk about your, the music, the way you're going down the musical road. So what's that? So that I mean, you've you know you've you talk about. Well, actually, let me read this one really quick. What do you think about the reply to Arecibo? Sorry. What do you think about the reply to Arecibo? Uh, sorry, I, I, I'm not sure what you're asking me there. Is that you know what Arecibo? Why can't I? That sounds very familiar. Uh, if Space Cow could. Uh, oh, well, I think I, I, the, the honest to God answer is that if, if we talk about the Arecibo. Sorry, I, I thought we were referring to somebody who's just posted on the side there, but as in like literally somebody who's used that's a posting name. Um, the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know enough about that to give you an intelligent answer, so I'll be respectful enough not to even attempt it. Okay. Yeah? I'm, not sure, I'm not totally sure. I, 
I haven't read enough of it to to trust literally the people who are telling me the story. That's the point. Yeah. Okay. And I, so I want to talk a little bit about your other books and your area, you know, other areas of of work. You know, I mean, obviously football okay. or interest, football, and then music. And so right. I want to talk about your your music and what you've done with that. Okay. Oh well. Um, so I've, I've got a radio show. I'm keeping it really simple. My guess is that a lot of your audience tonight would probably have had a similar experience to me when they were younger, particularly if they're old enough that they were buying music before the internet. I.e., I was often I'd be the I had I, I grew up sort of slightly better off financially than a lot of my mates so I tended to have more records and a bigger bedroom so people would come around to my place to listen to music and you still have and all your you, records behind you right oh yeah yeah I've still got the vinyl man listen I'm not showing you the remote hard drive because I mean one of the things if you've got a radio show I'm drowning in downloads I've got this you know so I've got eight gig that I don't even keep on the computer because it's you know so um did you I just get so much free stuff now which is a it's a situation that my 16 year old self would have killed to be in i think you know just all that pretty music but i i had um this is explained on the on the website of the uh, the radio station I, I work on but i basically explained it that when i was younger people would be around my place listening to music and they'd turn around to me and say what well, you paid money for this crap you know yeah <laughs> um and to, and to this day i still think i'm right and they're wrong um, but I mean, obviously, the internet has been a big enabler now. So that um, if there's one of me in every town, and you've got an internet radio show, then that one person in every town can find you, can't they? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, the, the one without banging on about it, the, I've also had a lot of interest in the kind of culture around music over the years, and, and I've written about this. So um, I did do a book on Beatle conspiracy theories, which did quite well. I do a talk on that, which Ooh. maybe another time I'll turn up and talk about it. But yeah. um, I don't claim that any of these theories are true. I mean, the, the, there are, there are well-known ones that John Lennon was assassinated to order, which is rubbish, but it's interesting rubbish. And the Paul McCartney died in 1966 story is really interesting. For my money, the most interesting one is the one that never took off. There was a claim in the mid 1970s that George Harrison had died and been replaced by an imposter. And it was an American. Yes, yeah. I remember hearing about that. Yeah, yeah, right. There was an, it was an American woman called Claudia Gill, who, um, who I never managed to get my hands on. But when I was writing the Beatle book, I did, I'm not sure I'd recommend this, but I did actually swap um, written communications with Mark David Chapman who the guy who shot john lennon yes. who uh did, didn't want to talk about shooting john lennon but wanted to try and you know tell me that he'd found god and helped me to find god um mm. and so I, I did um a book about beatles myths and legends which covers all of those kind of theories about the beatles including um the belief that they were a working band a working recording band until john lennon died and therefore recorded under at least three pseudonyms um, and therefore, you can go out and buy the records to this day. Um, I mean, look, what, what now? Yeah, it's, it, 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 the point of the book is not to make anybody believe it. The point of the book is to examine the way that um, a cultural phenomenon like the Beatles, who were that powerful, could make people believe so many different things. And what those stories tell you is in their own different ways they tell you a lot about the way people behave so it's not a million miles away from ufology so to give you a couple of simple examples one reason that the paul is dead rumor got such brief traction but was quite well known around the world is quite simply that when the beatles press office realized what was going on they did nothing to stop it uh, and again you know I, I think it's important when i'm on your show let's talk about things that your audience can go and check Prior to the end of the 1960s, when an album, when a band released a new album, it was not normal that their old albums climbed the charts, right? Mm -hmm. And the yeah. watershed for that, the big watershed moment for that was Abbey Road. Uh, in the wake of Abbey Road, the other Beatles albums, particularly the White Album, started selling huge amounts again. Now, I can't give you a figure for this, but the, the chart, you can't lie with the charts. I mean, that, they, this really happened, and not just in the United States. But just a guess, the Paul, Derek Taylor, who was the Beatles publicist, 
chose to do nothing about this story, right? He was well aware of it going on. One thing he would have known, and Capitol Records would have been telling him, was that old Beatle albums were selling as Abbey Road climbed the charts and people wondered that Paul might be alive or dead. And the evidence, in parentheses, the evidence that Paul was dead is hidden in little bits and pieces on the records, isn't it? Yeah? Brilliant. Right, okay. Well, okay, but there is no figure for this, but my suspicion is that some of the records, some of the white albums that were bought in the wake of Abbey Road coming out were probably replacing copies that had been destroyed while people tried to listen to them backwards. Yeah? Um, <laughs> no, but just look, again, This is, you can check this out. If you, wanted to, if you wanted to hear Revolution 9 backwards, i.e. the phrase Revolution 9 played backwards at normal speed, right? Um, that is turn me on dead man, right? That's mm -hmm. the, when you hear the clip, you can find this on the Wikipedia. When you hear them say, when you hear the words turn me on dead man, that is actually that, it's the title of revolution I played backwards. Well, in 1969, the only way that most people could do that would literally be to get um, a vinyl record and push it backwards on their own stereo. I mean, these days your computer will do all of that, right? Uh, and actually there's an interview with Paul McCartney that's quoted in the Beatles book where somebody had come to his house near the Abbey Road studios. He lives, or his London home, he's between the Lord's Cricket Ground and the, the recording studio, Abbey Road. Um, so fans knew where he lived. <clears throat> and some fans had come around and, and asked him whether it was true about, um, I won't actually say the message, but it's obscene, but what the garbled stuff at the end of sergeant pepper is supposed to say right yeah yeah okay they asked paul mccartney about this and he said that's rubbish it was just some random stuff that and so he apparently the story he tells he went back into his house literally turned his record player you know just just so that he could and he listened to it and he thought they're right <laughs> yeah the second <laughs> yeah and, and i mean you, you know you, you your audience can google what it's supposed to say but um it's basically we will have sex with you like as if we are supermen but it's not literally oh, that. yes 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 yeah, okay. yeah exactly yeah. right but even paul mccartney heard it so it's you know it's an interesting thing about that the i mean the different stories tell you different things the whole thing about the george's dead story tells you a lot about obsessive fandom but actually weirdly when i i researched i remember reading about that when i was at school and Years later, I wrote it up for a magazine about 30 odd years ago for a British magazine. And I went and did some research on it and almost treated it with an open mind and thought, well, if there were other clues, could you spot them? And I won't bore you with the whole story, but if you go and look at the album covers and the titles of the records and some of the lyrics, it stands up. It's utter rubbish, but it stands up, yeah. Look, have me on another time, I'll tell you about the day I nearly met George Harrison. I was gonna to talk to him about that on TV, yeah. Yeah, and it, it didn't happen. <laughs> the producers rang me, and then it didn't happen. But um, which is a shame because of all the Beatles, he's the one I would have most liked to have met. Real way. Hmm? Why? What intrigues you about him the most? He's he's just a wonderful collision of the cosmic and the really down to earth. Yeah, you know um, the lyrics of all too much are like that, and. I think he's hugely underrated as, well, first of all, he's this, the best and the worst of his music. The quality control is quite variable, but at his best, he's as good as the others, albeit very briefly. But he's hugely underrated in terms of the things he got right. Um, he was probably the first significant musician of his generation to start making records when he wanted to make them rather than thinking he had to knock one out every year which in retrospect means he's got a smaller catalogue, but a much more credible one, mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. Um, he, some of the other things he did intuitively really well. So he, he was, a, he was a, an exceptionally good film producer. So if you think about how badly the Apple, the Beatles Apple operation went, right? You know, they had the best, the biggest ideas and the, the best intentions, but they just, threw a lot of money at rubbish, okay? which is interesting. But George Harrison learned so much from that. He actually did what Apple should have done really, really well. Um, Handmade Films, which is his company, did so much good for the British film industry. And he was very understated about doing that. I mean, I know he made a joke about it, but 
the original funding for the life of Brian didn't come off. He was mates with Eric Idle, who was one of the Monty Python crew. Yeah. George Harrison, quite, you know, his glib comment was, well, he paid for the movie because he wanted to watch it. <laughs> yeah. But no, he was much more astute than that. Much more astute than that. Um, he had, he absolutely had a touch for most of his life as a film producer. Only towards the end did he start getting it wrong. But from such humble beginnings as a film producer, most people would not get that lucky. And the only reason you would get that lucky is that you would have an intuitive sense of which projects were going to work and why. Yeah. And yep. you'd bring the best people in. So there's a lot more to him than people realize. Um, and he would have just been a really interesting guy to me. And I, I like the way that, and I never really got to the bottom of the whole cosmic consciousness. And yet in other ways, he was as much a rock star as anybody. So, you know, um, the Hare Krishna stuff. Yeah. But he, you know, he was prone to driving ludicrously powerful cars around country lanes in Oxfordshire to the point of scaring the locals sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But then the ultimate thing is, spirit. You know, he, was, he had the sincerity when he nearly died, when he was stabbed and he nearly died um, at the end of the last century. The eyewitness accounts completely agree. He started chanting Hare Krishna because he was ready to die. You know, he, he'd accepted this, yeah? The only reason he didn't die was that his very pragmatic Mexican ancestry wife picked up a huge table lamp and hit the guy with it, yeah? <laughs> She, she basically, had she not intervened, he would have died, yeah? Um, so when, it, when push came to shove and he was faced with his own death, he was clearly, he didn't suddenly, his religious affectations didn't melt away. He was the real deal. And he'd have been, I struggle with the whole Hare Krishna thing and the Hindu faith on that. But on the other hand, I really like talking to people who've got a devout religious faith. And sometimes when I hang out with them, they teach me things about myself that I didn't expect. I like that. Did you ever, I've got a, did you ever see the Ruddles? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but George Harrison's been, George Harrison's in that. That's right. I need to watch it again. I just, yeah. I Monty Python, the Beatles. Yeah. And it's just, I, oh my, I love, I love that movie. And it's just that book incredible. I told you about. So the Daniel Levitin book about um, This Is Your Brain on Music. Um, he explains a lot about the importance of timbre, as in the quality of sound. Yeah, mm -hmm. and one of the examples he uses as an example of where that's done exceptionally well is in the Ruttles, that it works because they've got the nuances of the sound, and that's quite an achievement because clearly they they start parody in early Beatles and they go right through, don't they? Yep. To psychedelic Beatles, and any single one of those is a difficult parody. So to pull off, to pull off an entire career across an album like that is superb. And but I think partly because Eric Idle and John, George Harrison were such good mates, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the Ruttles is such a good spoof. I think probably George would have fed him things, or even possibly you know just just overheard one. Of, I mean George Harrison and Eric Idle worked together quite a bit. And around the time of the Ruttles, Eric Idle had a TV show called Rutland Weekend Television in this country, which George was a guest on it. So, you know, they they clearly collaborated. So it, it's it's no accident that they got a lot of that right. I, I, you know, I, I need to find it and I need to watch it again tonight. That's as long with, you know, trying to find, go down little rabbit holes that you've given me input on, which sound very actually fun and productive. But the Ruttles was just I, one of those movies that I saw. It was like Spinal Tap. You know, I mean, Spinal, yeah. the Spinal Tap will always be one of my <laughs> favorite. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, can always, I was not long ago, I was having a discussion with somebody about, we were just arguing the toss about which which jokes in movies are so good you can watch them over and over again. And there are there are two or three moments in Spinal Tap that just do it for me. They, you know, things go up to 11. And, um, you know, <laughs> and, I mean, and the cucumber. The yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's sorry, it's not the most politically correct thing, but these, and I can't remember the line that precedes it, but there's, um, th th there's a comment to the effect that critics have been harsh on Spinal Tap and they don't get the depth of their music, and then they immediately cut to them on stage playing Big Bottom, don't they? Right? <laughs> Which, Talk about mud flaps, my girls. Yeah, exactly. And there's just, you know, it's, it, I just, I, what I love about that because it's, it, they just leave those things hanging there, and it kind of. It, <laughs> just dawns on you and 
I, I don't know how it's regarded in America these days, but there's a really famous film critic over here called Mark Kermode. And in the trailer for his programs on film or whatever, he constantly, there's a, just a one liner he puts in there about whenever you watch a mockumentary, people say, is it as good as Spinal Tap? And his answer to that is, well, it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree you know? with that. I mean, I just, I remember, I mean, and these are scenes that just will always stick out to me but when they were getting ready to go on stage. And they got lost and every time they'd open like a closet door or, you know, another one of my favorite things, thanks for letting me go down this rabbit hole because it just makes me smile so much. But when they were in the cocoons on stage. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and then, and then the little the little Stonehenge that was. Yeah. Down. I mean, you know, they're all based on the truth, don't you? I mean, there's this it, they didn't literally happen. But for example, um the stonehenge stage set was black sabbath and it was the other way around um it was they oh, this might be apocryphal they ordered it and they made a mistake that they ordered it in yards and the people built it in meters so consequently <laughs> it was too big for the stages that's the story i heard yeah um what is beyond dispute the spinal tap crew only went on the road briefly with one band and the band in question was a british band called saxon who i'm going to see yeah um who are much more famous in the uk saxon are straight down the line good old british heavy metal and i'm going to see them i've seen them a few times i'm off to see them on a triple header with judas priest and uriah heep early next year wow. um, and S saxon are absolutely that band if i'm at a festival and I've had two or three beers and, or, you know, a few more than that. And Saxon come on. They are just, you, you wouldn't want to be anywhere else, you know? It's like, yeah, right. And I cannot, I struggle. It, more than five minutes of Saxon in the car and I'm struggling. You know, they are absolutely that animal, yeah? Yeah. Um, and, I mean, they're, they're an interesting band. There is a true story about Saxon, which is that, um, and you know, this is the band that's closest to Spinal Tap then, because they're the only band that Spinal Tap actually went on the road with. But um, Saxon work best when they're pretty low fi and it's just straight down the line anthems. But <clears throat> when they were briefly quite famous, they got the use of one of the best recording studios in the UK briefly, because the whole point was that they were having hit records, chuck a load of money at them, they can get bigger, right? Um, and they recorded some vocals in this studio and there was a like a little bit of whistle from the mic coming through and the studio had just been built to the best spec of the early 80s and so the studio crew could not understand this because they got the best studio they could possibly expect and there was something happening so they stripped the whole studio back and you know just went through all the kind of relays that where they were getting this interference uh relayed the whole thing again put it down and they got the same problem and then they realized <laughs> that what happened the microphones were so sensitive and the lead singer had some false teeth and they were picking up <laughs> God, <that's hard. laughs> they were picking up the air going through the underneath the teeth <laughs> so, <laughs> so they sorted it with a visit to the dentist <laughs> he's still there biff byford he's <laughs> he, he's he's still there he's i mean <laughs> no that um, that's that's for real yeah but um and, and he's still there he's he's still your, your main man out front of saxon and <laughs> yeah what i mean like what does it does he ever talk about that story um no i, 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 I don't i don't i know where i read it which is that it was in one of the music mags there's, there's a particular music mag in britain where a guy who'd been a music journalist for years would the last thing in the magazine was him just sharing the inside stories that he'd built up over a career. I, to be honest, I don't know enough about Saxon to know how much how how much they celebrate that and how much other people don't. <laughs> I, I, I just they're they're one of these bands. I will when I see them on stage, I love them. Um, but I don't own many of the albums, and basically, if you've heard two or three of the albums, you've probably heard as much Saxon as you're going to need. But that, that's just my opinion. Okay. Yeah? No, this is I'll, I'll, I'll be, this in, in March next year. I will be shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of people who own every album and know every word. Yeah, uh, right. So I mean, they 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 continue and they still play festivals and they do okay. So you know, 
I don't feel too sorry for him. Get in Judas Priest? Like seriously? That would be so wild. That would that that is gonna be cool. Yeah. I- I mean, I'm not the biggest heavy metal fan, but I've got a particular mate that I go to gigs with, and the one thing we agree on is good old school metal. Just every once in a while, just you know, take your brain out and just let it hit you. Yeah, clearly, what happens. Yeah, I love Motorhead. I mean, I, we saw them when he died. We couldn't. We actually had a discussion. We we're trying to work out how many times we saw them, and double figures, but not far into it. But I loved every Motorhead gig. And I, I I would have it out with anybody that they are hugely underrated. They're lyrically speaking, they're way better than most people think. And the genius of that band, sorry, we've gone off UFOs here, haven't we? But the genius of that band, crudely, is that they don't have a bass player. Lemmy is blatantly playing a bass guitar, but when you saw them on stage, um, he played the bass guitar the way most people would play a rhythm guitar. So if you listen to the records, you don't really get it. It's just when you walked into a fairly small venue with Motorhead on stage, it's like you stood there, they come on stage, and about a second later, you've suddenly gone back 10 feet. Like, <laughs> what the hell do you think? me? You know? <laughs> oh, right, it's the sound. Yeah, I get it. And they were just, they were primal, but in a really good way. Um, and yeah. They, they is cool. it Lenny, right? Lenny, I mean, he, Lenny, when did he yeah, pass yeah, away? Yeah. He passed away. A few years ago, right? Did Lenny pass away a few years ago? Yeah, yeah, he was just 70, yeah. So he, he passed away, died in over the Christmas, was it 2014, 2015? But he died. Uh, we had tickets for a gig he never played. Um, he was, we were due to see him about six weeks later, yeah. But he was, I know he lived in America for most of that time, but he was that shot I showed you earlier on that band just buried in the light so yeah Lenny first became famous because he was a member of that band Hawkwind but the whole thing oh. about it, he was he allegedly was it's not true but the the apocryphal story is they sacked him for taking the wrong drugs um <laughs> but Hawkwind were all dope and acid and Lenny was more your speed merchant you oh. know, so, oh. um, that, that's, that's, it, it's it's not true but um sort of apocryphally it is true um, and the whole thing about, I mean, you know, we, you couldn't get everybody who was ever in Hawkwind on one bus. They'd been through that many musicians. So Lemmy was one of many, many that, that passed through that band. But um, that's where he learned a lot of his stagecraft and stuff. And, and the, the song Motorhead, which gave the band their name, was actually originally was performed by Hawkwind. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. All right. But- I have to ask you too because we're going down this musical route, but it, which is fun for me being a musician. But um, is De- or not? Um, oh my gosh, Deep Purple. They're British, right? Yeah. Well, mainly, yeah, yeah. Did you have you? Do you remember seeing the video for Hush? No. Oh. That's years old, isn't it? That's 1968. That's yeah. Rod Evans and Nick Semper are in that band. I know. I've, I've seen. I've seen Deep Purple, but I mean, they were that band include included two guys who were gone by the time they made deep purple in rock and became a heavy band now what, what, what's in the video for i've never seen it wait you know i would just youtube it you know because basically yeah it's uh the one for the memory books okay <laughs> pay for your therapist when you're done i know i will oh really okay no it's i mean it's it's just funny because i love like i have an organ a hammond organ sitting you know 20 feet away from me and i love like you know, after everybody's gone and just bust out a little deep purple and, and just, all right, it, like it, I love, it, I love them, but yeah, the it's just a funny. banging tune. And I saw a, a band in a pub a few years ago playing it, and they threw it in with a lot of what we call brick pop, which is the stuff that Oasis and people like that did, and it worked yeah. really well. Um, and yeah, it's it's an it's an absolute banger. In fact. I think there's some doubt about whether the guy that sings the lead vocal on that is still alive. Um, I've never seen his death announced, but on the other hand, he was he Rod Evans. He toured when Deep Purple were inactive. He got a band together and toured America as Deep Purple. And one of the reasons that Deep Purple came back in the 80s was that that was in danger of happening. So I mean, obviously they, you know, they whoever the hell he was playing with, that was not Deep Purple. But on the other hand, nobody else was using the name, so he as some people do, he kind of got out there and thought he could try and claim it for himself. I'm, I'm not sure if he's still alive, but he, he was a really good singer. He just, he was, they're a different band in the that early incarnation. They're they're a bit Baroque and a bit psychedelic. And if, yeah, it, 
cracking organ parts on all those early albums, yeah? Yep. And you should, maybe I'll take a video. Maybe all I'll right. send it to you privately. I'll, I'll, I've made a note of that. I will, I will check that out tomorrow, tomorrow morning, yeah. Yeah, no, the Hush video is really funny because the lead singer, they're all, I mean, they've got to be just stoned out of their minds. I mean, just and they're all by a pool. And all the right. lead singer is wearing like a little Speedo or like a grape leaf. Oh, really? <laughs> it's just like... Who came up with this? Probably oh, really? nobody. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, okay. was... Well, that, that might explain something because that was a hit in the United States, but not in the UK, right? So Deep Purple really were only significantly like popular in the UK after 1970 when they made an album called Deep Purple in Rock. And by that point, they were a different band. So the new bass player, new singer, much harder rock sound, and that's the smoke on the water lineup, basically. Yeah. Um, and uh, Hush was not any kind of hit at all in this country to the point where um, I don't know if they play it on stage these days. I mean, it's uh, they're, they're, you know, the, uh, there's there's only one original still with the band now, anyway. But um, and you know, they they play like a kind of greatest hits. In a week's time, I'm going to see an ex Deep Purple guy playing Glenn Hughes, who was the bass player in the third version of the band. He now too is a kind of Deep Purple greatest hits. And that's that's probably more Deep Purple greatest hits than you hear from the real Deep Purple these days. <laughs> Good anyway, it's, it's just sure. a crowd moving show. It's, it's, it's everything you'd want. I always start Smoke on the Water, you know. Yeah, all those. I mean, all, Smoke all on the Water is like, you know what I mean? I just, it's never been my... My go-to deep purple. I just, I love, uh, yeah, Hush is, I just, that's. Oh, okay, that's yeah. Forever. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's three albums worth of that stuff before they got the, the other lineup. And it's absolutely, yeah, I, mean, I know what you mean. It's it's psychedelic and very Baroque in it, yep. yeah? Yep. And it, he could really, John Lord could really play. And that's the, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, I love it. And thanks for geeking out on music because it's, it's so good. In fact, I would love to just do a whole show on music. I would happily yeah, do that. Especially, well, I said, look, we, I'm seeing we've, we've run past two hours. Yes, here, thank I you. Would, I, I would lovingly do a music one. Apart from anything else, I wrote a book called The Devil's Jukebox, which is a fictitious thing, but it's like if the devil had 100 tunes on his jukebox, what would he have, right? Um, and I, I, I did do a book on um, 500 albums you won't believe until you hear them, i.e. some of the strangest stuff that was ever recorded. So... If we avoid the really disturbing stuff on the Devil's Jukebox, which is sick to the point where it probably people won't thank you for talking about it, um, yeah, I could, I could quite happily talk about it. Yeah, let's do it. It's okay, like job, it? it's not like proper work at all. <laughs> no, but this is, I love it. Let's let's plan it. I'll send you some some times, and we'll make okay, it happen. That'd be good. Yeah, yeah. Hey, and thanks that. for going yeah. over. Yeah. All right. Okay. Look, I'm, really, I, I'm thinking coming up to two and a quarter hours. Yep. We've probably covered a little bit of ground there, haven't we? Yeah. You have, we have, and thank you so much. So I will let you go and just yeah. make sure that everybody goes to neilnixon.com. Yeah. Just check yeah. out your website, find your books on Amazon. And yeah. Yeah. then I hope you have a good and very restful night. I appreciate you staying yeah. up late. And I hope you have fun at your concert. So keep me posted and let me know how they go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we, can, we can talk about that. Yeah, seriously. So thank you very much indeed. Thank appreciate you. that. No thank end, you. Erica. Yeah, and thank you to everybody who stuck with this for, for the whole duration of that. Much appreciated. All right. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Good good night. Take care. All right. Go well. Cheers. Bye. Bye. All right, you guys. Thanks for hanging out with me. And thanks for also adjusting to the different times and days that I've been doing the show lately. It's been really, it's just so wonderful to have Neil on and and to accommodate people. So thanks for rolling with me. I want to just, um, and I'm so sorry, Scott, I didn't get to ask your question, but I want to thank Peter and Jack and, and Space Cow and Jim and everybody for hanging out in the earth and uh, uh, Tony was in the house tonight. So thank you. I want to get Tony back on the show too. And, and Steve Long, um, you guys are wonderful. Thank you to Jack Brewer for being here. As you know, he is my research partner for expanding frontiers research. You can go to that to pledge your support, which is tax, dedu tax deductible. We are in the work working phases of a new story, a couple new stories that are going to be pretty mind blowing when they come out. So stay tuned go to our website to sign up for our latest blog. And I appreciate you guys. Thanks for supporting the show. 
Mario, thank you for all you do. Thanks, Peter, as well. You guys have a wonderful weekend. And I will be back next Friday at the usual time, so 5 p.m. Mountain Time. You guys have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Okay, if I can find the outro, this will be great. All right, guys. See ya.